corruption for health of the sector, where we can <coughs> focus within our ranks and have a, a, a very frank conversation about uh, the challenge of corruption and how we can overcome uh, uh, the, the challenges of the day. We have a program that is contained in a little booklet, a purple booklet, it's on page 13. That is our proposed path of engagement for the day. I, I believe everyone has a copy, and uh, unfortunately we are running uh, behind schedule. Uh, very quickly, I think I would like to, to welcome the senior technical advisor. My Lord, the head of the anti-corruption division, Justice Kibido, the deputy director of public prosecutions and chairperson of the JLOS technical committee, director CID, assistant DPPs, your worships, uh, officers from the Uganda Police Force, Uganda Prison Service, uh, colleagues from Sugar Turf, led by the deputy director, Ms. Valentine Namakula. Colleagues from other JLOS institutions, ladies and gentlemen. Good morning, good morning. and good welcome morning. to this first JLOS annual anti corruption forum. This forum has been organized as a dialogue, and we intend for it to be an annual dialogue, bringing together the JLOS institutions for us to have a focused discussion on our efforts in the fight against corruption. And our fourth sector development plan, we have specifically focused at outcome two on the fight against corruption. In previous sector plans, we had general strategies towards accountability and improving the transparency within the sector institutions. Under the SDP4, we chose to focus specifically directly on the fight against corruption. And as the JLOS institutions play a very lead role in this function, we felt it was important for us to have an opportunity to get together and have a discussion on how far we are achieving our own objectives, our own goals towards this, this important, uh, very noble um, task. We operate jointly with the, the accountability sector under the Interagency Forum. We have other opportunities to discuss with them. And for those of you who were able to be with us yesterday, we had a very fruitful discussion together with our colleagues from the accountability sector with the general public. And I believe that was an opportunity for us to gauge the temperature of the situation in the country, how the public views us in terms of the fight against corruption. And that sets the ground for us to have this discussion here today. So the forum follows on that discussion yesterday but also now provides us an opportunity in-house, together, without the eyes of the public, to have that frank discussion. What are we doing right? What is working? And what are those areas where we still have challenges that we have to address? The theme for the forum today is purging profits out of corruption, a critical reflection on the effectiveness of sanctions and, recovery, and asset recovery. We have, of course, had legislation put in place to facilitate the fight against corruption, but we are continuing to look at ways in which we can make this more effective. And looking beyond imprisonment or sentencing of convicted persons to how we can increase the risk and the, and the cost of corruption so that it, it ceases to be a lucrative option. This discussion, therefore, will also look specifically at some of these issues and the presentations will guide us in that particular respect. I want to first of all thank the Office of the DPP for agreeing to convene this session and to guide us through yesterday's process but also today's process. We appreciate that, my Lord, and we look forward to working with you to make this particular process, the forum, and the recommendations that come from this forum a success and a uh, a process in which we can fruitfully implement our sector development goals. I wish to thank His Lordship, Justice Kiruru, and the Anti-Corruption Court, who have also supported us through this process, both yesterday and today. Uh, we look forward to the engagement, our colleagues from the Uganda Police Force. I want to specifically thank Sugar Taff, who have provided us with technical 
and other forms of assistance in this process. They continue to be a partner and a friend to the sector. Uh, we want to just extend our thanks and our appreciation and we look forward to continuing this relationship um, over the rest of this year. My Lord, we know that the time is a bit late. I don't want to speak for very long. My task was simply to welcome you all. So I welcome you all this morning and I wish now to hand over to the chair of the session. I think at this moment, just have one singular duty to call upon our host, the Director of the Public Prosecutions, Mr. Mike Chibita, to come forward and open this uh, thank you, Chair, the head of the anti-corruption <coughs> court, uh, Justin Dudu, the director of CID, Rachel Kulo, deputy director, Mr. Lane, senior technical advisor. CEO Sugar Tuff, Valentine Namakula, uh, colleagues from Jealous Institutions, uh, ladies and gentlemen, good morning, we are welcome. <coughs> and uh, welcome back those of you who were with us yesterday. Welcome back from Africana, where we had uh, <coughs> the first bit of this engagement. And as uh, the senior technical advisor said, this is uh, the inaugural Jealous and Corruption Annual Forum. We've been uh, uh, having fora like this, uh, organized mostly by the accountability sector. And uh, we had a conversation within ourselves and thought we needed to have something where we could uh, uh, spearhead this effort, not as a competition to the accountability sector, but uh, as a compliment, <coughs> because we <coughs> both uh, we both uh, prosecute and, and corruption court. And as you know, there is a lot of work and a lot of challenges, and there is a lot of sensitization needed, as we heard from yesterday. So we thought uh, we would come along and uh, and. Uh, launch this forum to be uh, held on an annual basis to be able to continue the fight against corruption. As an introduction, <coughs> the, this forum is an apex dialogue that will bring together all the 18 jealous institutions under the ban of fighting corruption and promoting a culture of accountability. The forum is a stock taking a reflection event that is tailored to highlight progress and provide an opportunity for more concrete strategy planning to overcome outstanding challenges. And as you've heard, our theme for this year is purging profits out of corruption, and we are doing a critical reflection on the effectiveness of sanctions and asset recovery. <clears throat> this theme is inspired by the increased application of criminal and civil sanctions against perpetrators of corruption. However, this apparently is not translating into a direct reflect reduction in levels of corruption. Therefore, the correlation between sanctions and their deterrent effect of corruption is a central issue that requires further interrogation. Indeed, premised on the national choice theory, it is widely argued that corruption is a crime of calculations. And just Gidu to say to this yesterday, that people act corruptly because the benefits aren't exceed the costs of punishment. The planned critical reflections during this forum will also serve as catalysts for more effective implementation of the JOLOS and corruption undertakings. And this is in line with the national and corruption strategy the sector development plan and the jealous and corruption strategy. This forum therefore should provide us with a stunning opportunity to confront critical corruption control issues in the spirit of better implementation of the jealous and corruption strategy and improve public service delivery. <coughs> 
Our theme is anchored on interrogating two aspects in the fight against corruption, effectiveness of sanctions and asset recovery. Sanctions, particularly criminal convictions in corruption cases, are an age-old approach of punishing perpetrators of corruption. In addition, these are often followed up with uh, asset recovery orders or compensation orders for the loss occasion. Some jurisdictions have implemented legal actions against tainted assets that are judiciously deemed to offend the law and therefore forfeited to the state. Just uh, to know how this uh, has caught on, and, uh, this is uh, the trend that is going. Last week, my office and a few officers who were in Dar es Salaam to attend the annual general meeting and to celebrate the 10th anniversary of something called ARINSA, Asset Recovery Interagency Network of Southern Africa. As you note, we are not in Southern Africa geographically, but uh, we, were, uh, we were invited and admitted as members of ARINSA last year. So this was our first official attendance to the AGM. But this, uh, this has been going on for 10 years in Southern Africa, and indeed they have recorded quite a, a number of uh, victories. So we are trying to learn from them, and uh, they have uh, some best practices that we are trying to bring back home. Of course, we are also members of uh, a similar organization called ARINEA, Asset Recovery Interagency Network for East Africa. And I think the Inspectorate of Government, Uganda, holds the chair. Yeah, and uh, our chair for that is, uh, is, uh, is, is here. And again, we are trying to emphasize the fact that uh, this is not in competition, but we have to complement each other. <coughs> Uganda has mainly achieved the legislative development recommendation. Uganda has, for instance, registered a high score of 98% of its legal framework, but law enforcement at 51%. These figures uh, were provided to me by Jelos, so I trust that they are accurate. In other words, as far as legislation framework is concerned, we are at 98%. We are doing quite well. That is excellent performance. But as we all know, implementation and enforcement of the laws that we have becomes the biggest problem. <coughs> and um, <coughs> we are at 51% uh, there which is also a bit surprising because that seems to flatter us that we are, we are enforcing at uh, above, above average. And yet when you see on the ground, especially in the area of traffic, enforcement of the laws is, uh, is very poor, but I guess that's the average on all the laws. Therefore, beyond legislative development, law enforcement is very important. Law enforcement efforts must be effective and target at deterring corruption through undermining its underlying incentive structure. The economic theory posted by Baker denotes that people commit offenses as a result of calculation of opportunity cost of deploying time between lawful and unlawful options, determined by what yields better payoffs. It propounds that realizing utmost effectiveness of legislation requires an optional balance between two facets, therefore the probability of apprehension and conviction and the size of punishments. <clears throat> this analogy is central in analyzing the effectiveness of anti-corruption interventions and balancing the nature of legislation and enforcement. This also could explain how perpetrators of crime continue to commit offenses where the expected utility is positive. <clears throat> Economic theory can improve the implementation of anti-corruption laws by increasing probability of being caught and the magnitude of punishment, over and above the probability of escaping with the reward from corruption. This is the thrust of anti-corruption law enforcement. The focus should be on increasing the punishment probability and optimizing costs of the magnitude of punishment. A highly punitive legislation that is seldom enforced is not effective. And of course, the lawyers here know the example of uh, the Ngoli Act, which we all learned in school that uh, it is honored more in breach than observance. 
And uh, because uh, part of the problem we were told is uh, the law enforcement officers are the greatest uh, offenders of this law. So it is hardly enforced and therefore you, it, it gives an example here of uh, the, the difference between uh, legislation, as you know, from police, and then they come through to the office of the director of public prosecution, and eventually they end up in court. <laughs> Judicial convictions in corruption cases are not only a mark point of successful legal and corruption action, but also an indication of a functional and efficient system. Criminal convictions are a product of a chain-linked process stemming from investigations conducted by the Uganda Police Force, prosecutions, and ultimately adjudication. The Uganda Police Force works on complaints registered by members of the public, referrals from other institutions, and intelligence collected. However, the greater question is, why is the perception and supposed prevalence of corruption not reducing a midst consistent and improved and corruption criminal prosecutions? Indeed, somebody observed that uh, it seems the more laws we make, the more crimes are committed. I think the correlation is not that uh, more laws encourage crime, but I think the laws are trying to catch up with the crimes committed. Successful prosecutions resulting in criminal convictions and effective asset recovery are conditioned on various independent variables, including comprehensive policy and legislation framework, functional and coordinated institutions, efficient and streamlined processes such as investigations and prosecutions, competent human resources and political will, among others. Therefore, interrogating the two critical aspects of the anti-corruption legal machinery provides a window of opportunity to examine not only the outcomes, but more importantly, the inputs and procedural aspects. In addition, there are functional administrative mechanisms that handle corruption cases within the jealous family. The major ones, as you know, include the Judicial Service Commission's Disciplinary Unit, the Uganda Law Council's Disciplinary Unit, the Judiciary's Inspectorate of Courts, Professional Standards Unit of Police, and the corresponding police courts, both of the Uganda Police Force. According to the 2018-2019 Jello Semi-Annual Report, ODPP handled and con con concluded 72 cases at a conviction rate at the anti-corruption division of 68%. This is an impressive performance. In addition, case clearance of corruption cases and complaints through the judicial and quasi-judicial mechanisms increased during the reporting period with the anti-corruption division at 160%. Judicial Service Commission at 300%, Police Court at 50%, and the Law Council registering 24.5%. And this low performance of the Law Council is largely attributed to challenges of realizing quorum for the disciplinary unit that is comprised mostly of non-permanent staff. Therefore, an average clearance rate of 1.8% across the jealous sector exceeds the annual target of 97%. However, this can be further enhanced with the short tend turnaround times. This would send a strong deterrence message to potential perpetrators of corruption or acts of impropriety. In addition to the exemplary case clearance, the Anti-Corruption Court raised revenues of approximately $2 billion in uh, 2018. This comprised of uh, $880 million through fines and uh, $19 billion from asset recovery orders. However, with nascent asset recovery machinery in place, actual realization remains low. For instance, during the six-month period of July to December 2018, my office recovered only a paltry 3% of proceeds of crime. We were discussing with, uh, with the head of the anti-corruption court about the challenges of trying to enforce uh, compensation orders 
through the execution division of the High Court and uh, through other measures. And also realizing that uh, what has already been said, that corruption fights back and uh, they will not uh, willingly let go of uh, the ill-gotten wealth. So part of the discussion will be to find out how to uh, expedite the process of uh, enforcing these compensation orders. Overall, despite the achievements realized in the criminal prosecutions and convictions, administrative sanctions and the emerging asset recovery efforts, these are not directly translating in a direction in a reduction of the public perception of high official corruption. It is ordinarily expected that effective enforcement should translate into a reduction of both actual and perceived corruption. Indeed, the 2019 Transparency International Report returned Uganda's corruption perception score of 26%, with 0% being the worst score for highly perceived corruption. And this 26% was returned for a second year running and despite this stagnation, Uganda improved from the 151st position to the 149th position. We improved by two positions. However, this calls for greater reflection <coughs> and dialogue about the form, approach, and priority focus of not only the national corruption interventions, but more closely that of the general sector. It must be recalled that some jealous institutions have suffered reputational challenges because of the continued perceived and actual prevalence of corruption. Some jealous institutions are frequently cited as the most corrupt from both local and international surveys. The proportion of citizens who perceive most, if not all, police officers as corrupt increased from 63% in 2012 to 71% by 2017, when that of judges and magistrates, present company accepted, increased from 29 in 2012 to 43 by 2017. There's something called the Afro-parameter. These are their statistics. In addition, the 2015 National Service Delivery Survey indicates that 75% of respondents run police as the most corrupt government institution, followed by local governments at 50%, and government health facilities at 8%, and the judiciary at 19%. This are uh, UPO statistics. Of course, there are some explanations on uh, why things are the way they are, and so on, and uh, that is part of the conversation we'll have to have. In response to the, these challenges, the current jealous Strategic Development Plan 2017-2020 calls for the rollout and implementation of the JACs as part of the process to enhance efficiency and effectiveness of jealous institutions to fight corruption. And one of <coughs> the major undertakings is for jealous to dialogue and improve coordination in the fight against corruption. This indeed is intended to harmonize approaches in the fight, afford peer learning and enable the sector to collectively tackle a common problem. Therefore, this forum is a key contributor to this focus. This forum is organized as a jealous stakeholders meeting to explore topical anti-corruption issues with a view of one, taking stock of anti-corruption gains in the sector, two, appreciating the prevailing context, and three, mapping strategies for reform. The focus is the entire anti-corruption chain from investigations to asset recovery and how to better implement the jealous anti-corruption strategy. Under the proposed theme, the forum seeks to explore and interrogate the specific topical aspects regarding corruption, prosecutions, and asset recoveries. And this will include taking stock of the performance of the Uganda Police Force, Office of the Director of Public Prosecution, Judiciary, and other administrative and corruption mechanisms in con corruption control within the broader national context. Two, re-examining the effectiveness of sanctions in fighting and deterring corruption. Three, analyzing the current regime and effectiveness of the asset recovery as an anti-corruption tool and the existing legal and existing framework. And finally, extending the frontiers of corruption control by exploring awareness for innovation and all 
alternatives, more effective anti-corruption approaches. It is against that background and with those objectives in mind that we are gathered here this morning. It is my hope that by the close of today, the forum will have achieved the aim for which it was convened. I thank you very much for coming and wish you fruitful deliberations as I formally declare the forum open. Thank you very much. On the problems of corruption, of course it is trite that in order to effectively fight corruption, we must always go after the proceeds of crime. Nobody should be allowed to benefit from crime. But then again, we find that despite these wonderful laws that we have here, we are not really succeeding in bringing down the levels of corruption in Uganda. I wish to tell you a story that happened when I was a resident state attorney in Jinja. There was a lady who was, by that time, having AIDS. She was a police officer. And at that time, the cost of treatment for AIDS was very high. And this lady, as you know, there are policemen in this, in this room. Police officers are not the best paid. So she was dying on her bed and she had children and so on. But she also had an exhibit store in which there was some good money. So this lady decided to use this money and buy drugs and treat herself and perhaps guarantee something for her children. This one, of course, was not allowed. It was criminal. It was everything. But then, when it comes even to the toughest prosecutor, even a malicious one, we find that uh, charging this person, of course the law must be followed, but uh, there is something that remains in you that says perhaps the situation should not have been like this. So, in fighting corruption, we should achieve an objective for the nation, a consensus that corruption is actually a very, very bad thing. But the mindset should not be that corruption is the only way which we can survive. I appeared before a parliamentary committee and they were asking me about the conduct of some state attorneys. And when presenting my case to them, I said, of course, we are very robust at fighting corruption. And whenever we raise this ugly head, we strike it down. But then the the fight is very difficult because of the low pay of these persons. Because in the end, to fight corruption, as I said before, there must be a consensus that is a very bad thing. But if people are treated in a manner that suggests that the only way to survive is to go in a devious way, starting from your own house helps, we will pay 50,000, and when they are sick, they have no way of financing their own, own beings. You had recently a retired justice of the Supreme Court who said his uh, guy wanted to shoot him because he gave him 40,000, and another colleague of his gave him 10,000 to make 50,000 to travel to Busia. It was not enough, and he was very angry. Why am I saying this? I'm saying this because as long as corruption is need-driven, then our task will be very, very, very hard. It will be a hard sell to fight. Because if, as in other countries which are number one, number two, because we are now number 149, those one and two and what not, their corruption is usually greed-driven. Once corruption is greed-driven, the whole populace will see it as a wrong thing. And once they hear somebody has looted money, stolen money, 
you have a consensus in fighting this vice. But when you have people like the police officer I told you about, there is some sympathy towards what they, what they may have done. So in the long run, it is my prayer and hope that we'll achieve some equilibrium somewhere where we eliminate this kind of need-driven corruption among especially public officers, and then we tackle the greed-driven ones, which will be easy to tackle, because as long as it is need-driven, it will be very, very hard to find. So, today is not my day. I may have said more than I should have, but I thought I should have shared with you that. And now, it comes to my major role here of inviting the indefatigable Lawrence Idudu, Justice of the High Court in charge of anti-corruption. He's a crusader against corruption, and he's a very wise man from the East. <laughs> Justice Idudu has been at the bench for a long time, maybe longer than we thought, but uh, still is there. So, Lawrence Idudu, Judge, please come and take the floor. Thank you very much. DPP, uh, STA, Director, no, Assistant Inspector General of Police, uh, we used to know you as Director CID, uh, uh, Madam Grace Akro, uh, Deputy Director LDC, I'm glad to see you after a long time. And all the officers from the EPP, IGG, the Uganda Police Force, uh, Director Sugar, the, all the invited guests, uh, protocols, uh, ladies and gentlemen. I am not sure that I'm wise, but I come from the East. Uh, <laughs> Yes, uh, I have prepared some notes for purposes of opening up the discussion. Uh, so it is not uh, going to be uh, a detailed paper that uh, is uh, presented. The keynote address, as you know, is not a lecture. It sort of opens up the subject uh, for further interrogation in the subsequent uh, uh, sessions. That's how I understood uh, a keynote, and I'm going to do uh, just that. Uh, you know we are time bad, but fortunately, I'm going to take a uh, shorter than I had been assigned. With the adoption of uh, the UN Convention Against Corruption in December 2003, which came into force on 14th December 2005, the international community took a significant step forward in combating transnational corruption. As you know, corruption is now a global crime. This convention specifically in chapter five, perhaps I should add, the whole chapter was devoted uh, to creating a legal framework for asset recovery. Several articles of the UN Convention, particularly Articles 51 to 59 of the UN Convention Against Corruption, aim at returning assets to their rightful owners, including countries from which they have been taken illicitly meaning covering of assets should not necessarily mean for your own citizens, but uh, we can also recover assets for other countries if they are found to be here. <coughs> Sometimes it can be a challenge to take back property to another country, as we shall see, but that's what that convention means. In other words, the convention is shutting the space
for hiding property or proceeds of crime. Our own anti-corruption act, specifically the amendment of 2015, which as you know was a private member's motion in Parliament, provides for mandatory confiscation of property of a person convicted of an offence under the act, including procedures for issuing confiscation and confiscation orders and other related matters. In that amendment of 2015, section 67, <coughs> capital A, the Chief Justice is required to make rules to regulate the procedure for confiscation and recovery of property. The Chief Justice has not made those rules. Uh, I was talking to the Director Sugar that uh, we have to make the draft rules for the Chief Justice. It's too big to sit down and do homework. Uh, but uh, I told her that we have to look at some, any place somewhere. We shouldn't, re we shouldn't invent the wheel. Uh, we should look at some wheels which are moving, and then we see whether we can, uh, subject to right laws, whether we can uh, do something. The Act also obligates Uganda to enter into reciprocal agreements, treaties, and arrangements for cross-border recovery of the benefits derived from an act of corruption. Corruption has no... I've said it's a global crime. It's beyond mere bribery. Basil used to be on the road, you are no longer on the roads. You are still there. It's beyond this uh, taxi driver bribing uh, somebody. Uh, it's now beyond that. People really, uh, it's a business. It's an international business. Corruption is an international business. So it crosses boundaries, you know. So Uganda is obligated under this act to get into uh, mutual legal agreements with other countries so that we reciprocate, reciprocate uh, by either sending back that property or receiving back property uh, from those that have stolen from us. Another legal regime governing this is the anti-money laundering laws. It has also similar provisions for confiscation of properties specifically money or proceeds of crime, uh, proceeds from that money. And the courts in the region, and this is not good news for uh, uh, Mr. Evans or uh, from the private bar, the lawyers, <coughs> this is not good news for you. The courts in Uganda and Kenya have held that the right to own property enshrined in Article 26 for the Uganda Constitution relates only to property that is legitimately acquired. Meaning, although Article 26 protects uh, uh, the privation of, uh, of property by the state, that property is interpreted to mean that stolen property or property acquired from proceeds of crime is not property within the meaning of the Constitution. So it's not protected. And uh, I think there are cases uh, there. We have a Kampasa Damian versus Uganda. That's the Constitutional Reference 5 of 2011. You know what happened to Damian? At the sack of money in his bedroom and uh, his house there and the wife helped themselves. <laughs> this money cannot be kept in the bank, as you know. Still, these huge sums of money, you can only keep it in your bedroom. And, uh, start suffering the stress. Every time you leave the home, you think that either the wife or house girl have accessed it. 
and before Damian, it came to pass. Uh, in the Kenya case of uh, Stanley Mombo versus Amuti, no, Stanley Mombo Amuti versus Kenya and Corruption Commission, roughly 184 of 2018, this one was passed recently, two months ago, so I'm sure they used our president. But they also said, no, you are only protected if the money is legitimate. And an illegitimate uh, property is available for seizure. DPP and Deputy DPP have explained here under uh, the senior technical <laughs> advisor, Madam uh, Odoi Msoki, why we need this law or why we need these procedures or why we need to take action against property. As to recovery, the main justification, in my view, would be to the first is to combat crime through its financial lifeline. We recover property so that we can discourage the, 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 that crime from being uh, uh, committed. So we make it uh, useless to steal and then acquire uh, property out of it. That's one way. Uh, and you know it is painful for somebody uh, steals and then that thing is taken away, the person suffers more than the original owner who had lost it originally. It, it is a humanly thing. Even when somebody drops 10,000 and somebody picks the 10,000 and then that person who picked loses the 10,000, that person feels more aggrieved than the original uh, owner of the money. That's how it happens. So we punish, we kill that spirit. We intend that that spirit, of, 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 we call it evil spirit, because we have also the Holy Spirit. But that evil spirit that uh, uh, accumulates uh, money through uh, uh, stealing should be killed. Then the second reason, and this is fundamental, I mentioned it yesterday at a workshop uh, at the Canada, is to return the property to the rightful owners. That money or that property, whatever your conversion you have made, belongs to the citizens. And it's important that citizens understand that when property is recovered, it is their property that has been brought back to them in one form or the other. It is important that citizens of a country understand that they are the owners of all public resources and that leaders only manage it in a trust for them. If we brought this into the mind frames of the citizens, they would be able to report corruption so that if my son got a job and within a year my son has built a house, a good house, uh, driving a good car and so on, the citizens should not say that my son is very hard working or that he's been working in a good place or that uh, he's very enterprising. They should report the nearest institution that my son is a thief, you see, that, that he's stealing, see, because they should know that those resources belong to them. Unfortunately, the public doesn't uh, have that mind frame. I don't know how we can make it known to them. How can we do it? Uh, it can, should come out through a discussion. It is important for the people to know that leaders only manage that property in trust for them. And that's how we can be able to safeguard government property. I think uh, 
there was a um, national address recently, and I think the president mentioned it. People don't see road signs or what are those things? They are solar panels for lighting systems as, uh, as their property. People see it as, uh, as, 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 as a uh, government property. People don't appreciate that they are the government. It is important for people to know that their sovereignty in Article 1 of the Constitution means that they have powers. Take away the money. They so that at least they don't uh, transact. Especially when there is no restraining order on some of the, are Like you did not know, like I, 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 I will say that the capacity to trace and identify properties is still limited. Uh, you, some of the properties were not identified to be restrained, so he was, tra he was transacting on those ones. <coughs> yeah, but uh, we have since recovered a number of properties from him and money. Yeah, I think that is all I can say for now. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Alice. I saw Justice Kiduro taking notes. If you get a degree, proceeds of crime, you write to the university to recall it, I don't know. And the children and the wife acquire the proceeds of crime. What we'll do with it, you advise us. Thank you very much, Alice. Once more, I now call upon Mr. Basil Bugisha. Take the floor. You have about 15 minutes. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. corruption. Critical reflection on the effectiveness of sanctions and asset recovery. Uh, my name is once again I'm Commissioner of Police, Basil Nisha. I'm a Deputy Director of Traffic and Road Safety. Uh, I've never worked in, uh, in police investigation. I've never attempted to recover any, <laughs> any assets, not even registering them. But uh, I don't see it anyway. I need a policy, policy making. But uh, I know there are some concerns when it comes to to our directorate. That's where I'm an authority. I've worked, I used to head the traffic with my steering department. I was there for almost three years. Then recently I was brought back, I think I'm making one year. Uh, I think uh, my road to Ludo clearly put it that the corruption is a big issue. And uh, sometimes I imagine possibly it could be the biggest problem we have around. Because it turns most things in administration upside down. Some of you may be wondering why we are keeping the sector that is gyros a bad name. But we are just the part of the of the bigger problem. I'm not here to defend the, what traffic officers do. You mentioned corruption from as a result of need <coughs> as opposed to greed as people who work in the justice around the other sector you know very well 
if someone has decided to commit a crime, even when you would imagine that that person has really got enough, he never spoke. Until we put the roadblock somewhere. So as much as we may sympathize with our officers, like the other day they talked about who was taking one street aids. But we know the problem is you can't leave the, the issue of corruption to continue. And then you say, oh, that one is for need. Because even when the need is satisfied, and the, my colleagues here are not attempting to recover the proceeds, then it will develop into greed and uh, until really someone at some level comes in and puts a roadblock. The, the sector is certainly concerned about the, the image because if they say police, public perception is this much, and the traffic stops that. My request is that at various levels, when we are discussing, especially with those ones who are responsible for distribution of resources at the national level, especially in the administration sector. My feeling is that if we can satisfy the, the, the somehow the need maybe we can make some I was somewhere for, for 18 months where I was interacting with the, some officers from other countries. Some of them I compared their salaries with, other, with ours. And uh, they were comparable. And I also came to learn that the levels of corruption were a bit low. But there are several factors which were affecting that. One was cost of living, especially when it comes to spending on social services. You would find that these people, their money they would basically be spending it on, on food. Education, their public education was good and public health was good. So, what we would say would compare in the salaries, they would be spending it on just a take home basket when they go to the market. But in our case, for example, in my position, you read some time back that the, in the last six years we have arrested over 800 officers and charged them with being corrupt. Now, at one level, you find the fire of that person has to come to you. And when you pick this fire, you find that 90% of the documentation there is about request for loans. And most of those loans, the reason is that they want school fees. 
and the loans they are getting, in most cases, is 3 million, 4 million. Yes, I know there could be a few traffic officers who could have excelled, have had some rumors, also have not confirmed that some of them could be holding maybe five communities. But when it comes to asset recovery beyond that, I don't think there is really much to recover from, from, from my personnel. Then um, the other issue also which I discovered, sometimes people tend to be greedy because they compare notes. <coughs> if for example, you join the police with a colleague and that colleague is deployed in some institution where some of, them, some of them get as much as 15 million even when they are per month, even when they are lower in rank than, than us, the, the directors. So you find the people comparing the notes and the trying to, to catch up. I think there is a need, I don't know whether the Equal Opportunities Commission is handles that to make sure that the people who work in the government get the equal pay for equal work. I gave the example of the guard to uh, my road to justice Kanyamba. Now, if you give him 40,000, certainly, you know what happened. Maybe he knows why he expected more. And at the same time, you know it was not the, the role of the justice actually to, to pay. So, this issue of, uh, of corruption, my worry is that it is not about to improve. Why am I saying it is not about to improve? It discourages me when I see that the people who are supposed to be protecting us, who are supposed to be encouraging us to be upright, the same people who are actually teaching us to excel in corruption. I really get very bad when you get a call from a person of good standing in society, in most cases working in government, calling you please, my relative is working in a certain unit, every morning he carries a gun to go and guard. Please find where you can fix him or her because he's becoming a burden on me. Now, really, what do you expect us to do? And the presenter talked about how powerful some people can be. Sometimes you say, well, well, you are very powerful. Maybe let me have an extra day here. Then you say, well, well, we will consider. 
Because this thing has permeated society. I don't know. I want you, I hope we have a question and answer session. I want to be advised. What can we do? <laughs> One time I went to the village and my mom told me, ah, your grand leader was one of the members of the Grand Council has been looking for you. Sometime back when I was appointed to head of traffic, it has been looking for you. It has been here like three times. I said, where well, I respect my elders. Let me drive to his place. And the gentleman told me, said, I was you know, you read all the books. Recently, you were promoted, you are, we are told you are a commissioner. Actually, we understand you are, that time the IGP was Geno Kira, we understand you are, you are the next person in, 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 in the position. But uh, now you look around. This one's so sad to get his house. <coughs> The other side, you know, so and so sad. They are not from our grand. Eh? You, know, you are okay, the land you have, it has a very good view. Eh? He even pointed out where I should put the house similar to the other ones. He was pointing out. So you can see, in government, you have challenges. You both go back to the village. <laughs> <coughs> you meet same challenge. So, what do we do? And sometimes also, even in the working environment, you get a motorcycle, you give it to a traffic office, and it ends there. <coughs> DPC gets 800,000 per month for fear. How many liters are those? 200 for more than 12 departments under him. And he retired a traffic officer, even you traffic. You need to get a little share from this. <laughs> so you find this officer who gets this motorcycle. It will even get out or get worn out when it has never been serviced. He has never received the little of fear until it is written off. So, those are the challenges. I'm told my time is, is up, but I'm once again appealing to you. I'm seeking advice. We don't want to keep that image of carrying the mantle of being perceived to be the most corrupt <coughs> persons, not only in Jairus, but I think in the whole country. We also want to wear this uniform and feel very proud. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, President. Evans, one of the ardent defenders of uh, criminal cases <laughs> of those accused. I want to agree, my lord, that corruption is a vice that has eaten society and needs to be dealt with firmly. From the defense side, we do not actually protect the corrupt or defend the corrupt. No. My Lord, our role as a defense is to sieve out through the legal process, through defense, through
through cross-examination to ensure that justice is done. I have, my Lord, looked at the statistics. 70% conviction, 30% acquittals, and all that. Even in these cases where there are acquittals, I want to point out you will agree with me in most of those cases. What is common is money has been stolen. <coughs> you will always find, yes, money has been stolen. But in my pursuit as a defense counsel to find out who actually stole it. I find that this person is left off the hook because one, sometimes poor investigation. Sometimes, if it is something to do with the exhibit, it was mishandled. So it doesn't pass the test of court. But the fact that the money was stolen remains. I want also to echo my voice and my Lord to agree with you that uh, most of the accused in some of these cases are quite sophisticated both mentally and in training and uh, I want also to agree with you my lord that the bigger the amount the more sophisticated these fellas actually are because you will find a clerk may not be able to swindle a billion shillings in a ministry. So when you come across this case, you'll find most cases, principal accountant, PS, at that high level. And we want to say, by the time these people at that high level, they are trained. Now, why would he go scot-free? is the question. Have we built capacity to be able to investigate, detect, punish, and even at the, set, at the stage of asset recovery? Do we have capacity? Because you will realize this person may have been caught today of an activity which he has carried out for the last 20 years. Only this time the deal went wrong. That also connotes that the financial power is also high on their side. So, what we see wrong from our side, we want to point out that from the time of arrest, things go wrong at that stage. Either the officers who went to arrest uh, become part of corruption, and so some valuable exhibit has been left through those officers to go. And uh, I know my duty of confidentiality, but at times you find there is a document, it is missing, and when you are talking in confidence, it tells you that document was there, but we handled that. Council, don't worry, that document was there, but we handled that. It can't be seen. What does that mean? Corruption. That exhibit was there, but don't worry. We handled it, we dealt with it. So, we want to say that right from the time of arrest, 
all those structures need to be checked if corruption is to be dealt with. When it comes to investigation, how would you have an ordinary detective now who wants to investigate a procurement process, for instance? He has no training in procurement. He has no training in accounts, but he wants to investigate an accountant who is using the pen. Because most of these crime, they actually do not break the doors. It's a smart way. You look at the pen, look at the figures, remove one zero, you take it to the other side and balance it. So, I want to suggest that in this fight, we must also gear towards capacity building. If capacity is not built, then there is a problem, both with the investigators and the prosecution. On the defense side, I want to say that when they have complied with the instructions and they have paid, we read. So you must match up with us. Because I've been paid to research and find a way. But what is surprising is that most of this crime is a paper trail. You can trade. It came from Bank of Uganda, it went to private banks. So where has it disappeared from that now you have an acquittal? Yet there is a paper trail. Somehow, through corruption, the papers have two missing links have been pulled out. Then I want to indicate that I agree and appreciate that we do not have a good regime when it comes to asset recovery. The laws are weak, the rules are not there. It is handled as if it is a normal civil recovery, a normal debt between an individual where you file the papers and you begin chasing after the corrupt. In which case, my lords, I want to indicate that the execution division may not appreciate the full extent of recovery. We have tried to create something like a division there to try and help recover, but it has failed. I want to propose, my Lord, and you will think about it. If possible, you can have under that corruption court a mechanism of recovery so that what is anti-corruption related is built at that level. So that either we have a judge or a magistrate designated to handle orders of enforcement arising from that court, maybe the statistics may improve. Otherwise, you, you go to the civil division a matter is adjourned, you are seeking a restraining order or some order, it's adjourned for two months, like a normal civil matter. The corrupt will create an, an umbrella. You have given me time to find ways. My Lord said the oil is deep, so you have, so I push it deeper. So we are saying that one, even on recovery, a lot need to be done in terms of training. We need officers to be trained to detect proceeds. My Lord pointed, you will wonder how my son owns a home at the age of eight. 
He has a home. And nothing is in my name. Are we able to trace and detect this? This can only be done when we build capacity. I have pointed out that this, the level of sophistication is so high. So, I want to suggest and agree with you, my Lord, that we need an asset recovery body. So that once the prosecutors and everybody has done his work and the court has pronounced itself, perhaps they can be well equipped with the detecting, tracing, and recovery. Above all, my Lord, I want to point out that structures should also be put in place to ensure that these officers who handle these cases are protected. Security is key. We have handled the case where you are hearing, but why is Komo Hanji on my neck? This girl is the one with the problem now. Now, when an accused person begins to think of that, you may have crime developing. So we are saying, let's deal with the powerful individuals. They are dealing with the people who are connected. We do not want to come back and say, as we are pursuing the corrupt, there was a problem here. Thank you very much. Events. I think before you started speaking, there were people who thought that you had no heart, you were always defending criminals and so on. But you have acquitted yourself very well, especially in calling for security for the prosecutor. Thank you very much. So next, next we have Madame Sarah Biroji from the IG. Thank you so much, uh, Chair of the Session, the Deaf Daniel, my Lords, and everybody in attendance. The theme is a critical reflection on the effectiveness of sanctions and asset recovery. As we do the critical reflection on the effectiveness of sanctions, I'm um, of the view that we need to understand or go back to the starting point. What are the causes of corruption? If we are determined how effective the sanctions are, what causes people to be corrupt? And we agree that there are different forms of corruption, the brand corruption, the pet corruption, but when they are carrying out uh, research, generally they say corruption or such an institution is perceived to be so corrupt. If we distinguish the causes, like the chair earlier put it, the need to prevent corruption and the greed to prevent corruption, then I believe we shall be able to effectively analyze the effectiveness of the sanctions and asset recovery. For instance, uh, in our jurisdiction, corruption is widely defined. It ranges from bribery, several, several offenses there are under up to embezzlement of big sums of money. Bribery ranging from 1,000 shillings to embezzlement of billions of shillings. Do we want to say that a person who receives a bribe of 5,000 shillings, though the, the motive is corruption, the offense is corruption, has a similar motive with a person who embezzles billions of shillings? 
my answer is probably no. Maybe this other officer or person who receives a bribe of 5,000, 10,000, 20, or maybe it around there, bribery, to say in small denominations or small sums of money. There are causes to that. And now that takes us to the sanctions, like that Corruption Act, the penalties. If the highest is 240 currency points, if you caught me receiving a bribe of uh, 10,000, 100,000, and you convict me and you say I pay a fine of 4.8 million shillings, it might be hard, it might be a serious penalty on my side. Because I was looking for 100,000, you're making me pay a fine of 4.8 million shillings. It might be. So if I'm to assess the effectiveness of such a sanction on that individual, it might have an effect. But if I embezzled 2 billion shillings or above, and you convict me and order that I refund or I pay a fine of 4.8 million shillings, Will I feel a pinch? Will I be affected? Definitely the sanction won't be effective on me. So as we determine the effectiveness, we need to go back to the grassroots and appreciate what are the different causes, what are the different driving factors for people to be engaged in corruption. Once we appreciate that, then maybe to help us come up with appropriate mechanisms of fighting or reducing this animal corruption. Now going to the paper that was presented by Justice Didu, I picked a few issues. He said it's transnational, corruption is transnational. If we've dealt with bribery internally or within our jurisdiction, the transnational bit of it, from one jurisdiction to another jurisdiction to another jurisdiction, because they always want to stack away their illicitly acquired properties or assets. Do we as uh, practitioners have the capacity to follow those assets across jurisdictions? Do we have the connections? Do we have the equipment? Do we have the knowledge? Do we have what it takes to be able to follow the assets outside our own jurisdictions? Assuming we do or to a certain extent that we do have that capacity. Are other jurisdictions ready to work with us? If I approached a colleague, uh, my Lord Justice, you would say that we have, uh, at the moment, we have a, a small quarrel with one of our neighboring countries. If I approach them, assuming you're following an asset in that jurisdiction at the moment, if you approach them, yes, they've ratified the UNCA, they've ratified different legislations, but if you approach them right now, would they be willing to bring back that asset? Would they help you as Uganda, as a practitioner who is following an asset across the country outside your jurisdiction? Would you have the, uh, the capacity to get back that asset? Uh, my view is we need to think beyond. We have of been praised uh, for having the best legislation, 98% in fighting corruption, but the problem is implementation. The legislation is in place. How do we get things moving? The institutions are in place. Actions are taking place to fight corruption, but we don't seem to be seeing a reduction in corruption. Where have we gone wrong? I think it's high time we thought we, uh, outside the box. Yes, we have the laws, we have the institutions, but we have to devise other means to see that uh, we approach it from all angles, not limited to an angle of sanctions, prosecutions, investigations, prosecutions, convictions, then you recover the assets. Can we look at something else? What went wrong where? If the investigations, the prosecutions have not given us the desired results, maybe we get to know, are we playing our respective roles? 
I would say that citizens maybe are not paying enough or not doing enough. Are they reporting corruption? If they are, do they appreciate their role? For instance, a road construction is going to take place. Do they know that it's for their benefit, that they should be able to follow up? How is the procurement done? Who is supposed to do the work? To what level? If they don't do this, who do we report to? If the citizens do not get to know their roles and be able to report to the institutions that are supposed to follow, then, in my view, we are fighting a battle that we are going to lose. We are not doing much. We might have the sanctions, but you will not investigate or prosecute if you don't have intelligence, if you don't have leads, and you will not have witnesses on your side. A prosecutor will not become a witness in his or her own cause. There is need of a witness to put across those facts that the court will be swayed to agree with you that actually there was a corrupt offence. So, uh, can we do more than having the laws? Can we have? Can we think of engaging the citizens? And they should appreciate their role, not to leave it to the inspectorate of government, not to leave it to the director of public prosecutions, not to leave it to the police, and not leave it to court. It affects all of us. We each have a role to play. So it means we need to get back to them, sensitize them, and let them appreciate what exactly they have to do and how they have to do it. Has it worked for the inspectorate of government? To an extent, I would say it has. In some projects in the northern Uganda, where the inspectorate of government has been engaged or has been involved from the inception stage, like NUSAF, Dr. Deep, uh, YLP, and others, we find that the citizens are engaged, they're empowered, they follow their projects, they get to know what to expect. If there are cracks, you receive a call, they know the reporting channels, they tell you, we have this contract on ground, but we do not appreciate what is happening. <coughs> So you're able to arrest a situation at an earlier stage and you do not wait for a post-mortem investigation two years or one year down the road when a structure is in place, you find cracks, then you do post-mortem. Where did it go wrong? Was it a mixing of water? Was it uh, putting up uh, the, pole, the poles in the building? What went wrong? So at an earlier stage, you're able to arrest a situation. And in such a situation, the citizens are getting value for money you have the services in place. If it's a road, it's in place. If it's a building, it's in place and of desired quality. Then that means the public official is not prosecuted two or three years down the road for having caused loss of a, a procurement that went bad or for having embezzled the money or abused the threat of his office. So we need to get back and put in place structures or systems. Maybe if, we've ha if we have effective structures, effective systems, then we shall be able to eliminate the small or the little cases that would clog the system and deal with the major grand corruption cases. And then have all our efforts centered on investigating, restraining, prosecuting, and having the assets recovered at the end of the day. When you talk about, uh, my Lord uh, talked about uh, reciprocal treaties to recover uh, assets if you're going transnational. Yes, that's a good to do thing and we all desire to do that. But as you're seated in Uganda in Attorney General's chambers, in the Director of Public Prosecution's office or IG office, do you know who to deal with in America if you're following your asset that's in America? Do you know who to deal with in Dubai if there is an asset in Dubai? Yes, you might have information that actually the asset is in Dubai, but who do you deal with? Who is going to help you? It's very easy to prepare a very colorful paper that is going to be presented maybe to the Attorney General in the Department of, or rather Department of Justice in America. But they'll see it as an ordinary paper because they have so many papers coming in, mutual legal assistance papers coming in. But who can put a face, a name to the face, to this paper? It is signed by Justice Chibita. It's signed by Alice Kau. Kau. It's signed by Sarah Birundi. Who can put an, a face to that name and say, yes, this person works in Uganda. She has helped us before or he has helped us before. We need to follow through this request and ensure that they get back whatever they are following. So as we 
have ratified the UNCAP, ratified several other legislations, the reciprocal arrangement treaties have been entered as a country. We need to use other informal methods to help us effectualize, for instance, the mutual legal assistance request. We need to follow through to have networks outside our jurisdictions. In that regard, if we do that, I honestly believe we shall be able to follow through the assets in different jurisdictions. We shall be able to have colleagues work with us and help us get to present, say if you have a case to present in another jurisdiction, present your case and have an asset repatriated back to your jurisdiction. And I think if we do that, then the criminals will be hurt or they will be hit and hurt because now they will have missed out. But when we stop at prosecuting, we've not restrained wherever the assets are, they will know we shall be stuck. I can give you an example. We have a compensation order of over 800 million shillings. The properties are not in Uganda. We do not have a record of where those properties are. We have intelligence that they are somewhere in the US, but we do not know the description. So we cannot follow up. We have the compensation order. We are stuck with it. But we don't have where to go and get those assets. Assuming we had uh, taken advantage of all the networks, investigations were properly done, the records were properly kept, and we had leads, maybe we could have been able to apply, uh, in get, take legal action and have the assets restrained or recovered from the, uh, the, out, the jurisdiction outside Uganda. If, uh, if we continue working as uh, independent institutions. This investigation, this prosecution is for IG. I will not go there. I will not work with the DPP. I will not work with the police. There is a gap. Yes, the sanctions will be on paper. But you need the knowledge, you need the expertise of different institutions, technical staff in the different institutions to work with them and see how best can you harness that the skills in another institution to help you recover those assets, to help you have a good investigation, present a good case to court, and then be able to have a restraining order. Uh, service delivery or breakage of systems is a key driving factor. You find that we blame the private. I'm looking at the corruption of bribery where you need medication, you need to pay. If, you to, if a doctor is to help you, you need to pay some cute cute dog or some little money to be helped. It's because the services have broken down in our, in our jurisdiction, in our country. Poor service delivery is motivating this, the bribery bit of it. So can we go, can we think of how we are going to ensure that there is proper service delivery. If it's in hospitals, the doctors are there, medication is there, they report on duty, they are paid in time, they are paid handsomely, and they are motivated to stay on duty. If it's in police, if I'm reporting a case, I'll not be sent to go and bring fuel if we are to visit a scene of crime, go and bring paper, go and bring a pen, because if we rule out all those issues and streamline the processes, put in place uh, proper systems, you'll find that implementation or reducing corruption will be a little bit easier. We shall then be able to see that uh, these small motivating factors are out of the system. How do we deal with the bigger problem? The driving factors are very key. It's also important that we look at uh, If I've received that money, what do I use it for? The people that we take to court educate their children or would want them to educate, or they would want to educate their children in a school where a police officer would want to take his child, where a teacher would want to take his child, where a, a state attorney would want to take his child. But the, lef the, the ground is not leveled. How much money do you pay in a school where we're taking our children? Can we have all that streamlined? Can we have a leveled ground where we are saying health sector is well taken care of, education sector is well taken care of, the judiciary is well taken care of? Uh, my Lord, you forgive me, but when you, when you want to have a session,
to facilitate your officers to go for a session, you'd find that maybe the judiciary is not adequately facilitated to easily go for a session. So how are you going to dispose of that case which you think was properly investigated, which you think was, uh, you have your witnesses, because if you don't easily have them testify, the other powerful people who've been told that corrupt we are fighting are powerful. They will easily buy them off. So can we have uh, the national cake, the funds equally distributed to all sectors, and we have an effective system working? Um, Asset recovery is key, we talk about it, and it's easy, we want to give back this money to where it was supposed to be. But food for thought, does it help? If I've been caught in a corrupt offense, I embezzled 500 million shillings, I easily rush to pay it back, but you leave me in office. I've not pleaded guilty, I approach you and I tell you, I'm ready to give you back this money. And if you want, I can as well say, pay a fine of sorts, but please, can we have this sorted out of court? So if I pay you 500 million shillings, but I remain in office, have you sorted, have you solved the problem? The assets will be recovered. But are you not creating an avenue for me to now get an, a way of stealing this 500 to pay it back to you, you put it back to the cycle, but at the same time I'm depriving, I'm getting money, I'm using the left hand, giving it to the right hand, goes back to the institution fighting corruption, uh, DPP, IG, uh, CID, but I'm still in office. Are we solving a problem? Is that sufficient? I would say no. So what do we need to do as public servants or when we get people on the wrong side of the law, knowing the challenges and uh, how to get a public officer out of office, what do we do about that? Prosecution, we know it's tedious. You prosecute for so many years. Before you get a conviction, a person will not allow to leave office. But after, if you don't do that, you, you want to go by the public service standing orders, you have, a person has to be given a fair hearing. It takes a lot of time. A resignation cannot easily be accepted. What do we do? The assets can be recovered. The public servant is very ready to bring back the money. But he doesn't want, he or she doesn't want to leave the public office because he knows that's where he gets his bread and butter, that's where he gets his fees. It's a bit complex. So uh, as we think through that, yes, I would say to an extent, uh, uh, sanctions and asset recovery have played a role, but we need to go back to the drawing board, appreciate a few things that fighting corruption is not an individual role. Services have to be, uh, systems and service delivery has to be taken care of. We have to have a standard starting best pay and put everybody at par. If there is comfort, then maybe we shall rule out demand driven crime, corruption, and maybe deal with greed. And at that level, we might find better grounds of dealing with it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. She overshot by a few minutes. It's not that I'm that, um, very weak, but she was bringing some points which were very pertinent. <laughs> she raised, of course, the issue that we, this must be a joint effort to combat corruption, because we agree with it. And she also mentioned the issue of grand corruption versus this petty bribery. What the Wanaichi keep on saying that you are fishing the small fish and leaving the big crocodiles. I think the words came out of somebody's mouth, I don't remember where. <laughs> but uh, I think she's really on point. Because most people say you find a police officer in his white uniform standing in the hot sun of Vatago, for example, and when you give him 5,000 shillings, should not be seen as a bribe, maybe that's a donation to help him also meet basic requirements. <laughs> but this person who is stealing billions is actually a murderer. So is it time that we can classify this kind of uh, crime? Maybe we have aggravated cor corruption, and then simple corruption or simple bribery. And aggravated corruption should uh, attract something in the region of death sentence. Thank you very much, my panelists. We are running short of time, but we'd like to hear from you, members who have attended today. So, just talk about two things. One is assessment, the other is strategy. 
And I think mine is just a general comment. I have heard so much about the gains made in uh, the assets recovered. And uh, I heard Mr. Cheng's uh, contribution saying, as long as he's paid very well, he'll actually do research. Uh, my point is to do with assessment. I have heard three things. First, with or without rules, I think our courts are being faced with requests for compensation by prosecutors. And, uh, oh, my name is Bien Chatito. I work with Sugarton. So the courts are being faced with requests for compensation and whether with or without rules they're having to issue compensation orders. Now the uh, UK, the highest courts in the UK have actually given a threshold against which a compensation order can stand. <coughs> so the first is whether the defendant has benefited from the crime. The second is the value and quantification of that benefit. And the third is what sum is recoverable. All those are critical elements of assessment. Whether we are doing assessment or not, and why I'm raising the issue is that all the glorious compensation orders we have received from the trial courts are actually on appeal, on the Court of Appeal. And the question they are raising is, uh, I did not benefit. If I benefited, I did not benefit in the sum against which I was ordered to pay. So my concern is that we may have a situation where all our gains regarding asset recovery are actually rolled back on appeal. So I am thinking that the issue of assessment has to be looked at more critically. With or without the rules, there is a threshold under the law, and unless we meet it, whether with rules or not, everything we have done towards asset recovery is actually legally going to be reversed. And I think Mr. Cheng was very clear on that. He's going to do the research and he'll uh, perhaps have them reversed. My second point is about strategy, just to say, and I'm speaking from the point on working together, I think, from the chair. And I'm thinking that maybe, aside from the, uh, this is how I would understand it, we need to put together civil sanctions. Uh, our colleagues in Kenya have done very, very well, and I liked what uh, Madame Belungi from the IGG was saying. We need to explore civil recovery. I know there's a discussion around that. I hope that succeeds. So I'm suggesting we have civil recovery, we have criminal recovery, and then we do admin sanctions. Like they were saying, someone is in prison, but he's already signing checks. I want to take it a step further to say, even when they're in prison convicted of corruption, some of these people are actually still receiving salaries. So uh, that, if we have the admin civil sanctions, criminal sanctions and admin sanctions underpinned by <coughs> asset recovery and interagency corruption, I, I, sorry, cooperation. I think that's very important. Why am I talking about interagency corruption? We have received you, a matter has been filed at the SCB, quite a number, and the accused persons are saying... I think that's enough. Okay. <laughs> you give somebody else a chance. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. My name is Florence Makmachwadolo. Uh, people who are not here when we're introducing ourselves, a deputy director at Lord Government Centre. I think we need to thank all these panelists. We the file that you're going to handle this file. Do you defend that accused? You go to court and you uh, in one case the accused was really looking like the accused, beaten. <laughs> you're here, defence counsel. I'm representing the accused. And you know, prosecution is taking their time. The investigation is still continuing. Case again. And the gentleman walks away. His bail form is signed, and you go away. But he was feeling like there was something wrong because he lacked confidence in the dog. And here you are saying he's innocent. So what time we told him, you need, we need to talk. <laughs> okay, madam, I'll give me an appointment. I'll talk to you. Tell me everything. It's easier to defend a person when you know the whole story. Tell me what really happened. Say, madam. Okay. I don't know whether I should talk today. Maybe another day. I said, what's the problem? Where are you hurry? He was off the job. He's being prosecuted for causing financial loss. The sum was about 12 million. I said, you know, tell me what happened. Did you really take the money of this organization? He said, yes. Is the money there? No. What did you do with the money? 
you see, my wife had married and a customer in law who was pestering me for a wedding. He was an accountant, he knew the signatures of all his bosses. So it was not difficult to do certain things. And then he went out, I'm like, is that what you did? I'm sorry he did that. So, and he used the money for a wedding. Say there was even no need for meetings, I don't know what. There was enough people enjoying the drug. Like, okay. And uh, your wife, she used to come to court. Is she aware of all this? But uh, please don't tell her, she doesn't know. Don't tell her. She doesn't know. I can assure you, defense counsel, I lost morale to defend that case. No, okay. That is a good case for plea bargain now. We have that plea bargain. That's why I brought up the story. Plea bargain at an earlier stage would lead to some recovery. If at all the money is stressable. But money used for entertaining people in a wedding reception. I don't know how you can trace that. <laughs> you know? Is it the offsprings you're going to punish? I don't know. Attach the wife? <laughs> All the guests who enjoy their goodies. <laughs> so it's difficult. Indeed, Alice raised it. It is difficult. So I just told, you know, I told him, you know, if you can refund the money, we could talk to the other side for security. Say, no, 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 I don't have anything. The money actually was used for a wedding. I'm like, okay. Actually, just gave the file to another colleague. Say, you know what? You can handle this file. Give me any other of your batch. I lost. You know, you feel like, okay, the person you're defending is supposed to be presumed innocent under Article 28 of the Constitution. But is the fellow really innocent? My conscience. So, plea bargain could be another solution. Defense counsels. Plea bargain could be a solution for quick recovery. If the person is willing to go through plea bargain, I think he might recover. More assets. Thank you. Thank you very much, Morris. Go for the imminent judge. I thank uh, the, the, the panelists. There's uh, just a little clarification, if you permit. Uh, uh, on asset recovery, yeah. in the morning we were a bit wider. It was asset recovery and the other catalog of, uh, of sanctions. But uh, we are delighted to have an expert panel that, that uh, is going to lead us through, uh, looking a bit more at the mechanisms, comparative experiences, what we have in place, and in a very concrete way, what do we need to put in place yeah, to but it's uh, move one Good afternoon to you. I'd like to take this opportunity to welcome you to this afternoon session. Yeah, we are having very technical people, persons to discuss the issues at hand. Um, I was advised that uh, we needed to run through this session such that we can give time uh, for them. the resolutions to be drafted or we discuss the, the resolutions. So, with that uh, brief recap from the moderator, I would like to suggest that um, we just uh, move to the discussions by the panelists. So we are going to have a presentation uh, from uh, Lee Thompson, the strategic advisor, asset recovery, uh, sugar TF, TF, on the uh, topic uh, critical reflection, I beg your pardon, exploiting current asset recovery mechanisms and strategies and their effectiveness for bad team action. So I would like to take this opportunity to welcome the key speaker to give our remarks. Then we shall thereafter get the panelists uh, to 
with their remarks and then we're going to a plenum. <coughs> Thank you very much. We have to work. I will try extremely hard. So, thank you very much. I'm um, under instruction to go as quickly as possible. I was already <coughs> going to struggle to do this in the time allowed, so bear with me. Um, I wanted to start very briefly by looking at a definition of asset recovery because I'm conscious that there may be some people in the room for whom this is an absolutely new concept. So, keeping it absolutely simple terms, it is the retrieval of the direct or indirect proceeds of crime and hopefully any profits therefrom. It's not a complex concept. How the assets are concealed and therefore how we retrieve them becomes extremely complex. But I think if we don't lose sight of why we're doing it, that complexity doesn't need to be overwhelming. Why are we doing it? The simple fact is prison is not a deterrent. It's not an effective one in this context. <coughs> Proceeds of crime are what drive the acquisitive crime. Nobody commits this kind of crime if there is no financial reward of some description. We've said imprisonment is an insufficient deterrent. We possibly need to compensate and want to compensate those who've been cheated, wronged out of the proceeds in question. A key component of asset recovery is that the process itself even where there's no conviction secured, is likely to disrupt illicit financial flows. That's a huge achievement, even without going down the conviction route. Public faith in the criminal justice system. Every criminal justice system I've worked in around the world has suffered at some point from a crisis of confidence from the public sector. It's about showing them that you're doing something about corruption. And I'm going to talk about something much beyond corruption, but uh, we will stay, to a degree, focused on corruption. It's about removing negative role models from society. Is it right that our children witness that crime does pay? It's not appropriate for people who have no real legitimate employment to be cruising around neighbourhoods in cars which they could never possibly afford unless through the proceeds of crime. That is not the example to set the future of any country. So we're targeting those in possession of the proceeds of crime. As I said, a very simple concept which unfortunately as time goes by becomes ever more complex to pursue. So, I hope this next slide resonates with everybody who's working in this field in this room at the moment. If you're not working in this field at the moment, please empathize with those who are, because they are being asked to do a hugely taxing job on top of their substantive work burden. It is very resource intensive and I'll get to that issue later on. But critical to this process is the fact that there is no way of separating out the components that make up asset recovery. Detection, we're talking about finding, locating the assets, the proceeds of crime. Preservation, we're not going to leave them in the hands of the wrongdoer or the potential wrongdoer. We want to make sure they're safe so that if they're acquitted, they can be given back. And if they're convicted, they can either compensate a victim or they can be taken by the state. Now, then, obviously, after looking after these assets, you actually want to do that recovery. You want to enforce 
the compensation, the confiscation order that might be made. Again, not quite as straightforward as it sounds. But the truth is, if you overfocus on any one of these three areas, the chain collapses, the process collapses. It's critical that we have strength in all three of these areas. And by this, I mean we need solid intelligence facilities and resources. We need effective law enforcement. We need effective prosecution and courts that are fully on board with these concepts. So it really is a chain-linked approach. If one message only could go home with everybody today, it would be that. Get in early, go wide, and go deep. It's really important that we attack recovery at the earliest possible stage. It's no use hoping when a conviction is secured that there will be sufficient assets floating around for you to collect up and put into the government coffers. If they were dishonest enough in the first place to commit the corrupt act that got them convicted, they are certainly dishonest enough to ensure that the proceeds of their crime are not around for you to recover. So getting in early, by that, I don't mean early as in you know, when the matter's part way through trial. I don't even mean on day one of the trial, or necessarily on the day of charge. Uganda has some really powerful legislation which will allow the freezing of assets when the investigation has just begun. These are really far-reaching tools, and it's about using them at the earliest possible stage, where operationally Viral. Go wide. What do I mean by this? There is a natural reluctance in many jurisdictions to look beyond assets um, which are going to present challenge if you freeze them and to focus on assets which are relatively simple to deal with. If all you look at our land and bank accounts, then that is all that will be left at the end. And it does, of course, make a dangerous assumption that by simply placing a restraint order on land or over a bank account, that that will be honoured. We all know that there's been significant fraud at the land registry. We all know that banks don't operate necessarily in the way that we would like them to. There are people who will be able to circumvent these restraint orders if they are not properly policed. <laughs> going wide means going not only beyond the traditional remit of uh, banks and land and easily caveated properties, but stretching to things that have a real value and that can be preserved during the life of the restraint order and will give real value at the enforcement stage. Go deep. Be prepared to look beyond what's obviously there. Because they will have gone deep. And as time goes by, they would rapidly go deeper and deeper and deeper. So what in essence this is saying is, is you have to be a hawk if you're going to be effective in asset recovery. You have to be an aggressor. Aggression will bring progression in this area. Doves, I'm afraid, go very, very hungry indeed in the recovery world. So this is what I've been asked to look at. I've been asked to explore the mechanisms and strategies um, and their effectiveness in combating corruption. I've highlighted four words and I put one in red for the following reasons. I want to look at the four highlighted words in a little bit more detail in a second, but let's start with the fact that the strategy is in red. It's in red because it worries me. I don't know that there is a strategy in existence. There is certainly not a unified national asset 
recovery strategy, which is really what I'll go on to talk about later, is essential. Because what we currently have are organizations who are doing their level best in very difficult circumstances, but everybody's doing it a little bit differently. And that, of course, creates anomalies in the court process as well, and isn't helpful to streamlining and accelerating the progress of recovery generally. Mechanisms, we're going to look at those briefly in a moment because I think there's good news and bad news on the mechanisms front. Um, it is an exploration because I, I think this is largely uncharted territory here in Uganda. It's still hugely uncharted territory in many of the recovery jurisdictions I've worked in because it's a work in progress. Asset recovery, like many areas of the law, never stop developing. Corruption I've highlighted because I don't believe that by focusing on pure, traditionally crafted corruption indictments, we are necessarily going to reach all levels of corruption. So, what Sugar Taft did in brief in May 16, um, and then in September 16, and then we're doing today, was a sort of assessment process of what we thought on paper the situation in Uganda looked like for asset recovery. I can tell you, I didn't conduct the assessment in May 16. Um, it was very bleak indeed. It said that there was no hope, basically. Um, there was no capacity, there was no legislation which was um, capable of really recovering assets, and that basically we should all go away and come back when an all singing, all dancing proceeds of crime bill had been passed introducing civil and criminal recovery. I'm sure there are some people in the room who remember hearing this message and were distinctly unimpressed and offended by it. And I can only apologize to you now, as I did in September 2016, when I conducted my initial assessment. Um, my initial assessment uh, in many ways stands to this day. I saw huge promise, both in the personalities in play, but also in the legislative provision which existed at the time and has since been improved uh, through amendments which came through in 2017. That's not to say I didn't think there was value in encouraging progress on a bill which would introduce more far-reaching powers and most importantly consolidate the disparate legislation which exists on asset recovery into a single uniform piece of law which would make every prosecutor's job in this country infinitely easier from a recovery perspective. So, in brief, I believed Uganda had great reason to be optimistic although to be realistic and accept that the very cumbersome nature of this diverse spread of legislation meant it was going to be a lot of extra hard work. Where are we at today? Well, I, I think that's what this paper is designed to look at. Before we look briefly at, at where I think we're at today, I just wanted to put this by people for whom asset recovery is a new concept. For those who aren't, this is all standard, but it's really important. Uganda's history in recovery, statutory uh, recovery history is relatively short, as we all know. Although I know Uganda enjoyed feudal version of asset recovery in the same way the UK did. So the concept is not new. Statutory take on it is relatively new and Uganda's asset recovery history in terms of actual dedicated asset recovery units is even newer. We had 2015, I believe, we had the formation of the ODPP's unit, and then um, closely followed December 2016, I think, uh, by the IG's formation of an asset recovery function. So it is a relatively short history, and it's in a commendable position today in light of the mere four years it's been moving. 
I'd ask everyone to remember this. It is, however, a journey without end. I'm always deeply suspicious of anybody who uh, claims to kind of be there, have sorted it, be on top of it. I just don't think that's possible because you're dealing with people who are out there working 24 hours a day, seven days a week on epic sized, incredible legal teams whose sole purpose is to frustrate your efforts. So anybody who claims to have arrived should actually be extremely worried. Now, I want to, to throw some comfort in there though, and that is that the UK, South Africa, the UK back in the 70s we started to dabble in a statutory approach. The South Africans brought in their Prevention of Organised Crime Act very oddly titled, but nonetheless, with Asset Recovery as a focus in 1998. Yeah. Here are regimes which are kind of in theory coming into their own, but they're still undergoing radical transformation. They're responding to what they're seeing out in the criminal marketplace. And the really good ones are sometimes not too far behind either. I understand from Tito that um, I think yesterday, um, a certain very eminent individual reminded us all that we have to behave like gorillas, constantly be suspicious, <laughs> basically always keep moving. And it's the same story I really want to push today. That we don't have a map. I think it's our moral duty as asset recovery players to contribute to generating a map but be aware, just like the maps from four or five hundred years ago, it's not going to, to remain the same. It's, it's not a solid state. It's constantly evolving. We have to evolve with, evolve with it. And I think the more dialogue you can have with people, both within Uganda and outside it, to understand their experiences, to draw from them, to hopefully not have to repeat the pain they've gone through, the better. I should caution though, at no point should anybody be looking to transplant one regime into another, to directly pluck law from one place and insist it applies to another. It's about taking what is of value and seeing if it fits, if it works, if it's appropriate. Um, this, I don't, I don't want this to be too tiresome for people for whom this is absolute bread and butter. But I think it's useful for people who don't ordinarily operate in this world to hear what's available, what is on the market in the asset recovery world right now in Uganda. So, I hope all of you are aware by now that Uganda operates a um, criminal-based asset um, recovery system, or conviction-based. So essentially, in order to enforce a compensation or a confiscation order to recover the proceeds of crime, you first have to secure a conviction against somebody. Okay? Now, controversially, and I'm going to tell you why it shouldn't be controversial at all, there is a push to introduce some non-conviction based or civil recovery provisions which would enable the proceeds of crime to be recovered without a conviction. I'm urging you to see that this is not remotely controversial because effectively Uganda, like many other jurisdictions, has it by the back door anyway. I, for anybody who doesn't believe me, I've got a slide later on, come and look at it later. Um, you, you Section 80 of your Uganda Wildlife Act, you have forfeiture in the absence of a legitimate explanation for the um, property in question. It's, it's there. It's there by the back door. There is no reason not to embrace it. But that's to come to um, a bigger question about the future of the bill, which we can obviously discuss in the panel section. So the real question now is, on the criminal, the conviction-based recovery front, is our toolbox a good one? To give you an idea, 
Those 14 powers are 14 powers that relate to asset recovery that come from the Anti-Money Laundering Act. There's 17 the more justice that come um, from the Anti-Corruption Act. These asset management orders, or one, has still been made. I believe the official receiver was appointed in that case. The key part of this is, the worst that the court could say in that instance was no. And I think all of us should have thick enough skin by now to know that as long as we're not embarrassed by the quality of the case we put, so long as that was bona fide, then being told no shouldn't be a bar to asking in the first place. I'm going to go back to the Chief Justice Rules issue um, shortly, so we won't dwell on it too much now. Prosecutor's statement of benefit. This is absolutely critical, because this is what will enable the court to understand how much somebody's benefited, how much we say that person has actually got in terms of wealth, and where we say the apportionment is. This is a prosecutor's angle now I'm coming from. And that would then help the court determine issues of benefit, of apportionment. Very, very helpful to the court, cuts down a huge amount of court time. Um, I believe there is a, a silence clause in there which would basically amount to admission to the contents of the statement. Very helpful again from a, a moving things along perspective. It certainly concentrates the mind of the defendant. Convicted at this point, actually. Um, dead and absconded confiscation orders. I mean, that sounds like an easy win to me because there's nobody there to argue against you. Controversial, possibly a constitutional court application, I'm sure. Worth it? Absolutely. Because once you establish the ability to do this, these are the kind of things that can just roll on and on. Orders for payment instead of confiscation, this is an invitation again to say, we've done our best. It's not feasible. We can't locate it. The individual has gone. It, okay, so we can't confiscate, but we can make um, an order for payment and invoke all of the powers of enforcement that relate to that. Pecuniary penalty orders, we haven't had one yet. It would be fantastic to see. They represent the zenith of, of what the Anti-Money Laundering Act offers. Amazing tool, illicit enrichment. I think the IG took some very bold steps, early doors. Absolute hats off to them. Um, they, they pushed with illicit enrichment not long after the 2009 Act came in. And yes, the court gave them a hard time. But they weren't afraid to fail and I think have taken their experience from those cases and are working very hard on ensuring that future illicit enrichment matters are really, I don't believe anything's bulletproof for the record, but as close to being as it can be. Um, so for me, illicit enrichment charges are something which are again effectively civil recovery by the back door. You're inviting people really to explain how you who earned this much can own this much. It's asking people to explain the chasm between what's declared and what's actual in their wealth. And that is in effect putting them on the back foot. It's a very powerful tool. The more often it's used, the more wary people will become. It, if it doesn't actually stop them doing it, it will definitely push up the cost of them doing it. I'm very conscious of time, so I, I'm not going to be able to go into all of these as I would have liked to, but I think it's worth dwelling on one or two. Assessment. This is a very thorny issue because at the moment we, we have a situation where there is legislation which says that the 
court questionably must assess defendant's benefit in order to then go on through the apportionment process and the like. The fact is that there is a discrepancy between the title of, of this um, piece and the actual body of it. One suggests that the court has no discretion and the other suggests that it's for the prosecutor to apply or not for assessment to be conducted. So, putting aside the fact that it's not clear whether that is mandatory or not, what I would say is that it's a very useful process, not just in relation to the Anti-Corruption Act, but in relation to any proceeds of crime inquiry. Because the simple fact is, obviously, there is going to be controversy over who received what benefit in what amount, uh, what was done with it, who actually has realizable property left to enforce against. These are all questions which could, through, for once, I think probably a fairer here word would be a confiscation hearing, um, a process of inquiry to determine issues of benefit and apportionment and realizability. A valuable process one which currently lacks any real framework around it. One of the things I was going to say later on, but I may as well say it now, is that my experience is often that gaps are not necessarily bad things. Because if the court has the jurisdiction to fill that gap in some way, and develop the law accordingly, then it may mean the law develops in a more practical way than a piece of written guidance which was formed before the practical considerations came into play would actually have been. So sometimes I think negatives can become positives with a little creative input from the prosecution, from the courts. I think it's, it's definitely important to mention this issue about the power of the Chief Justice to make rules. That is the term, the power of the Justice, Chief Justice sorry, to make rules under Section 67A. That suggests it doesn't have to happen to me. It's a power to do something. But then the body of it says he shall make rules to regulate. It isn't therefore clear. However, what is clear, and I take this from direct experience, is that there are other jurisdictions out there who had similar provisions which would seem to be a bar to conducting any kind of um, activity without the rule first being made, who have gone on to conduct that activity in the absence of rules and have let the law develop naturally in the process. And if that's something Uganda feels it could work with, I think in the interim, certainly, it would be a valuable thing to do. The worst case scenario, as I, again I said earlier, is a no. The best is that some great practice evolves, which may ultimately inform the way that those rules are drafted. If they ever are, because certainly in South Africa's case, they should have been drafted 21 years ago. If you took this reading and said, you can't do anything until they're drafted, they wouldn't have done anything for 21 years. In fact, in those 21 years, they have made hundreds of appointments of asset managers without any rules. And they've dealt with this by formulating very clear framework, which is then signed up to by those who provide these services from the private sector. I've already said this is just those are just two examples of acts which contain asset recovery provisions. You've got masses more there to add, not only to the wealth of tools available, but also to complicate matters. And I guess this is really where we're at. This is what I'm saying about where we are today in June 2019. Yes, 
it's a wealth of legislation, but that's also a massive problem for prosecutors and for the courts. Because it means that we're not dealing with one uniform set of laws, we're dealing with a huge, huge range. Not only is it a huge range of laws dealing with lots of different types of criminality, there is no uniformity either in form or in substance. A good example of this problem would be confiscation and compensation are sometimes used interchangeably. Where's the certainty? What does that mean if we make an application for international cooperation somewhere and we use our compensation term and it's interpreted as confiscation in another jurisdiction and they say, well, we can't help because it doesn't really meet our criteria. We say, oh, no, no, we, we didn't mean that. That was in one act. Oh, ooh. It, it's very complicated and it's unnecessarily complicated and it's making the job of prosecutors unnecessarily difficult. I have huge sympathy with them on this level. Another example would be restraint orders. If on my indictment I'm, I'm looking at uh, offences under more than one act, if I only use one piece of legislation to get my restraint order under, and part way through the process I decide to drop the charges in relation to that particular offending, have I exposed the assets that are located under the indictment on a different act? Technically, yes, and you should be going back to court and making sure that you've got a restraint order under that other act. Should a prosecutor really have to jump through this many hoops? Should they have to remember when they apply for restraint that they've got to apply for it under three separate statutes to just about cover themselves? No, they shouldn't. And this is an unreasonable burden on them. I think there's an uncertainty that that, that uh, cacophony, if you like, of legislation also shows us that there are mandate issues. There's an ongoing question about whether or not being a competent authority for the purposes of the AMLA, the anti-money laundering provisions, is sufficient to allow Madam IGG to pursue certain, the use of certain tools under that legislation. Because she's a competent authority, but she's not necessarily an accounting officer. Well, she isn't an accounting officer. So these are problems which could be easily solved by a uniform piece of legislation. We don't have civil recovery in its purest form. This would introduce it and enable it to cover much more than it currently covers in the example I gave you of the Wildlife Act. Third party litigants. I mean, presumably this is every prosecutor's worst nightmare that they end up restraining something and then some third party crops up and says, well, actually, that's mine. And by the way, it's now worthless and it was worth 20 billion last week. And you now are subject to litigation, which I'm pursuing. Hello, Attorney General, can you please help me? Can you send somebody down to court now? I, you don't need these civil litigation headaches on top of everything else you're already trying to do. So that's another very, very real challenge and regular complaint that I hear. And this feeds very neatly into the resourcing issue. The fact is prosecutors will always believe that their primary objective is to secure a conviction. Obviously, whilst considering all of the objectives which they as prosecutors have. But, <coughs> The truth is, in the asset recovery world, in the corruption that we're talking about here today, we all know that the thing that's going to hurt the most is the taking away of the proceeds of the crime that they've committed. So here, it's about allowing both to move very, very clearly, steadily on together. 
and not losing sight of the recovery end. <coughs> That's a big ask when you're running the trial as well. Added into this is the cash-based economy which we operate in, which I think everybody has agreed presents challenges which I think everybody also thinks the digital world don't face. I'd say two things here. One, take heart because there is no doubt that we are inexorably moving towards a digital world. But don't for one minute believe that that will answer all your prayers because the reality is once you enter that world, you're simply looking at digital methods of concealment of layering. It's just a different problem. Well, it's the same problem packaged a different way, I should say. Um, I wanted to touch on something that I'm sure is very close to Sydney's heart at the FIA because the fact is, at the very beginning, I, I talk about getting in early, as early as possible. At the very beginning, you have raw intelligence. Sydney and his team take that raw intelligence, they analyze it, they create a fantastic product, which is then shared with the relevant agencies. It's a referral, for want of a better word. The magic of that referral is that it's so early. That's the time to be striking. That's the time, if you don't feel you can strike, then to be going back to Sydney and saying, great, I got it 10 minutes ago, I'm coming down to see you. I'm thinking that actually we probably need a monitoring order on here. Can you help me with this? I want to understand more. Sydney, I'm sure, would bend over backwards to make sure he met you there on the doorstep to talk about this. Why would he be bending over backwards to do that? Two reasons. One, it's his job. This is what they are there to do. Two, it's because it doesn't currently happen often enough. Is that a fair comment, Sydney? Okay. And that means that huge amounts of effort, and more importantly, intelligence, are floating around and not being acted upon, or not being acted upon soon enough. And soon enough is the critical element here. Get in early. Sydney can help you get in earlier than most, I would argue. So use him, use him to death, literally, nearly. Um, we talked briefly about comprehensive restraint. I don't want to labor the point, but please, please, please think much bigger than bank accounts and land and things that are within your comfort zone. Not least, it will brighten up your day. Um, there's a, a notorious case in the UK where some, a racehorse was restrained. And when it came to selling the racehorse, the management receiver in place notified the owner of the racehorse and they said um, no no you can't possibly sell it it's a family pet it, it's not an item of value it was of course worth hundreds of thousands of pounds it was an item of value it needed to be sold at a particular point um, and then when it became clear it was being sold and there was no discussion about it the lady who owned it rang the receiver and said if you sell it I'll make sure before you come to collect it. I cut its mm -mm legs off. I thought that was a fine way to treat a family pet, uh, but it's a reminder of the fact that what you can go after is so diverse and it can hurt them so much, much, much more than that uh, term of imprisonment. Don't, don't lose an opportunity to do that. Asset management, we've discussed briefly, it's possible. Push boundaries, what you're expecting. Look for the court's assistance. Um, These are very experienced people. It, it will often, ultimately, I see, to a degree, even in this, obviously, I, I mean this with the, the most respect I could possibly muster. Let it at least be a conversation when it matters where there is no clear direction. 
because everybody is in the dark from, from detection all the way through to enforcement in certain areas, not just in Uganda either. Um, I've already said at the beginning there is a danger, and I think we are currently, I'll be very frank, in danger of doing this of over-focus on a particular part of the process. Now, if we narrow the process down, if you remember at the beginning of that slide, we said detection, preservation, enforcement. That's a gross oversimplification, but if you take that simplification and you concentrate on just one element of it, the rest falls apart. If as we all know, at the end of last year, there was a call for um, unsatisfied compensation orders to be enforced. That has to be weighed in the bigger uh, picture. You've really got to look, what does that really mean? Because if enforcing a lot of compensation orders, which are old, many of which will not have had restraint orders in place against them, Therefore, the assets will not be available or will not be easily available. In that context, is it wise to... I've been advised that if you can summarize... No problem. Yes. No problem. Thank you very much. Is it wise in that case to put all your eggs in one basket, push down the enforcement road, which might be a relatively hopeless one, and meanwhile neglect current viable cases where you need to freeze, or, or, or look at Sydney's referral, for instance. So, overall, this, this would be my very, very skeleton-like roadmap for resolving a number of these challenges. Uganda, like everywhere else, needs a strategy and it needs somebody to lead that strategy. It needs the bill that I've already described, and that bill really does have to have a component of civil recovery within it. Don't be tied down to measuring success by how much you put in the tin box at the end of the day. Let people understand that by disrupting illicit financial flows, you are already contributing massively to impacting corruption and other criminality. I think, uh, and this was mentioned to me just before I started, so I do really want to make this point. It's critical to recognise that everything I've said amounts to an enormous amount of work by people who are already enormously overworked. It also calls for skills, if I just show you now, we've got a whole host of people there, they all make very important contributions to this process. <laughs> Ideally, they would all be involved in every asset recovery unit that exists. Am I starting to make the case for a dedicated asset recovery unit? Possibly. I've seen it fail miserably in some places. I've seen it cost the earth. I've seen it make crazy promises that it could never possibly have fulfilled. I would urge no one in this room to push for that. But what I would say is, don't feel that you can't push boundaries on asset recovery because you don't have the capacity. Push them now, make the case for it, and simultaneously illustrate how important it is that it's properly resourced. And if that means an independent, standalone unit, then so be it. If it means an independent unit within your institution, so be it. And when I say independent, I really do mean independent. I mean one that will enable all acquisitive crime to be attacked and not exclusively corruption. I say that because it's very important. I'm sure prosecutors in this room would agree. Corruption is a notoriously difficult crime to prosecute. As a result, prosecutors will often very reasonably look to other offending. And when they do that, if asset recovery is solely focused on the corruption line, we miss out. So keep a broad mind. Don't think asset recovery and corruption. Think asset recovery, acquisitive crime. So I think, yeah, they were my spare ones. I think it's probably 
fair to end on this point. Some of you I know have had the enormous pleasure and huge honour of working with Willie Hofmeyer, who is the rightly reinstated head of the Asset Recovery Unit in South Africa and was its head from its inception in 1998 and instrumental in creating their Proceeds of Crime Act. This is a picture I want you to all carry with you because it's really about failure and success. You see Willie there, he is renowned for being a hawk. He spent his whole life as a hawk. He is a wonderfully kind, generous man, but he's incredibly aggressive. He never, ever lets go, as those who've done secondments with him will know, as I know because I helped him put this um, unit together 20 years ago. So the key here is hawks, not doves, and fixing the problem. Willie had a big problem. He took, there was a cartoon, there were a few cartoons that went before this. He took all that property away. And I mean right down to the barest of things, fridges, you name it. It got very personal. And there was a big question asked about whether or not this was retrospective application of the law and therefore unconstitutional. Now rather than cowering in a corner, Willie came out fighting and said, we need to change the law. We need this to be right. It's important enough to get this right, to do it now, not wait years. And they did it. I think it took a year. And they did come out fighting, and that chronicles his return to action and the fact that he wasn't phased by failure. He just got back up, dusted himself off, and carried on. Please, please, please don't be disheartened by how grueling this asset recovery effort is on top of what you're already all doing. Because actually, if you don't pursue the asset recovery line, I really do believe that the penalties that will be dealt for the corruption, if it is convicted on, will mean very little to the people who are convicted. This, this is your real weapon. Please be bold, be a hawk, use it. And if, this is critical now, I would urge you to see that I think there's a real danger here. If these powers aren't first of all used, the broad range of them used, push to their natural limits, and shown to be insufficient to deliver what they should be delivering. If that doesn't happen, then the regulatory impact assessment for this Proceeds of Crime Bill will find that there is no cause to overhaul the existing recovery provisions. It will simply say, well, you know, we, we already have tools, uh, some of them are being used, Let's leave it at that. And I think that would be desperately sad because there's so much talent and there's so much potential there that could ultimately result in some great gains and paving the way for a new act. It would be criminal, literally, not to exploit it. I apologise again for running over. Um, I happen to think it was worth it. I hope you do, um, and I hope you'll have lots of questions for my colleagues. Thank you. Thank you very much. Big round of applause to Madame Lee. Well, thank you very much. Well, I should say, getting early, going wide, go deeper. So that is uh, the advice she has given because she also noted that. Uh, When you get in early, you can get a lot of very diverse areas of uh, illicit assets, which will really hurt. So as you get in early, it helps. She noted that uh, there are all those assets, other than getting up these people convicted, you can get into the assets. 
fact, who were informed in the morning that uh, there are some other new assets in the form of women and children. <laughs> so if you get somebody's wife and a child, <laughs> I don't know how, I think some police officers who are not well trained can easily get women and children and exhibit them. <laughs> yes, so uh, thank you very much, Maxine. Uh, allow me to invite Madame Josephine Amato uh, to give uh, her remarks. Madame Josephine has a lot of uh, experience in prostitution. Personally, I do in her hands, much as I'm bigger than her size. I, I worked under her when we were doing prostitution led investigations in the cases of uh, global farm. And it really worked because we used to move out with the, the prosecutors, the games, all these ladies you see around, and the gentlemen in the PPP, and uh, it really worked for us. I think we shall still uh, go ahead and do the prosecution led where the prosecutors also moved with the investigators. Thank you. That time, I adopt. I adopt the protocol that we have been going this morning. Okay. Uh, I'm just going to make a few remarks, but what I need to point out is that one, this morning what we have heard is that we have some measures in the form of laws and institutions, in the form of laws and institutions which have been at the forefront of fighting corruption. A concerning aspect about it though is that we seem to be doing well with the prosecution results, but that is not matched with the coverage that we have recovered, with our properties that we have recovered. Uh, Someone said, and I think I got the figures right, that the compensation we are 70%, rather conviction, but recovery we are 3%. Now this is worrying, and I think it's what I'm going to highlight in a few minutes that I have of where is the disparity and how can we be able to treat this gap. Uh, first of all, I have all the previous speakers that convictions alone are no longer sufficient to fight corruption. It serves no good for this thing for someone to get his custodial sentence, serves it in prison, but his wife still goes to visit him in their nice car. They remain staying in his nice house, his family, and his children continue going to those expensive schools which many of us can afford. And that is the impetus that should be driving us to recover these assets. And I also should point out, this concept of recovery of crime process is not new and detailed. If I'm to go back to the Bible, it starts from the Old Testament, actually, if you look at the Bichikas, there is this, there are these tenets of, if you steal someone's property, you pay back twice. And then there is this Luke 19 of the tax collector, that corrupt tax collector. The moment he saw Jesus, he paid back fourfold of what he had taken from his victims of corruption, uh, his corruption activities. And that is where we are coming from. As and the only thing that I need to emphasize to us this afternoon is that corruption is a business. My Lord just emphasized this in the morning. But corruption is not like any other ordinary business. I always tell my colleagues, it's not like these offenses where people have no challenges, these offenses of violent, rape, no. It is driven by profit purely. And no one goes for corruption especially the brand, expected to get into this. I need to point out the few tenets that production has with a normal business. One, they plan, especially the syndicate pro production. You may call it uh, things like, pardon me, you may call it conspiracy, but they plan, they sit and plan. They will incur expenses to execute their fraud. Sometimes they use rights. They have risks associated with their business. And such risks may include being detected by the law enforcement. And they plan on how to mitigate these risks. 
they make proof to like any other business. And they devise ways to survive in the criminal business and they're extremely innovative. Just like someone needs to remain relevant in the business, they will keep training and upgrading. The issue is how upgrading are we in detecting these properties and the crimes as well. And there's something very disciplined about syndicate corruption. These people are organized, sometimes we call it organized crime. They don't just wake up and do things like that. Some of the cases we handle, we find someone does a, performs a specific role to be able to execute a project scheme. And then it goes back to us. Our souls as we are how organized are we, how disciplined are we in performing our different roles to not only commit but also get the process. And of course they invest in information a lot and in legal services of their layers. They coordinate so well. And one of the things I need to emphasize is that coordination is very key if we are to succeed, not only in the conditions, but also as a recovery. Uh, someone mentioned earlier, that was Alice, about the successes that GDP has been studying as a recovery. But when she says that this is not only by the efforts of GDP's office, no, it is as a result of coordination right from investigation state, prosecution, and adjudication. And I cannot overemphasize coordination and cooperation. However, good one institution in a chain may be so good, and another is left behind. We cannot go in there. And that is something I think we need to take away. Uh, it is said that if you want to go very fast, you go alone. But if you want to go very far, you go together, you go with others. And that is where I come from. Now, going back to Liam's presentation, I'm just going through it with the news that we have. <clears throat> she talked about time being a essence in a situation of an entire government. These guys with technology can no longer uh, expect to sit back and give it time to act to prosecution and win that case. You will not find that property here. It's not like the ordinary crime where we find police chase and murder. The body cannot run away from you. But if you have property, it's extremely transient, especially with technology. I don't need a whole day to move money from one account to another. And the earlier we start acting with this, the better. The issue is we have capacity to detect that property and link it to the person we are pursuing as our friend. And that's very early system. Uh, she talked about concealment. Of, of property, my Lord Justice Kibu talked about this in the morning. This is a true challenge. These days, criminals, I said, they invest and they use even professionals. And Grace mentioned today, they recovered some property that are tied to the law firms. They've come across law firms and they seem to be serving criminals purely. They register companies for them and they transfer all these properties to these companies. Now, when you look at the company, most of them do not exceed 10 million shillings, and I'm not exaggerating. But the property they hold is worth billions and billions of shillings. They are not operational, but they own lots and lots of land around a land, even in our country. But the issue is, are we up to speed with the way these lawyers handle these things? There's a case again we are handling with police. And it's strange in a sense that. This person has a um, Caesar civil servant. I will tell you the earnest three hundred eighty, eighty-five thousand, something like that, close to four hundred. And we have used bank of Ghana, used two billion shillings of his accounts to open. And he was complaining. The issue is when the people wrote to this civil servant, PPP has powers and anti gender section forty one of the anti-corruption act to require some civil servants to explain what you have, what your spouse has, and all that. I informed of a son's statement. He forwarded it, but it was forwarded by the way. When we looked at it, we noticed this gentleman, first of all, he adds, he says, I'm running a lot of business, but when you read in the list of his employees and his returns to your life, the names do not exist. He has names like Toto, Papa, like that, no second name, but just one more name. So his explanation is, ah, I didn't comply with his returns. There is an accountant who handles my, my the compilation of my returns. He's the one who puts that pay as fund, he's the one who makes those fictitious declarations. So you realize they don't work for me. 
Then when it came to how he came to accumulate that food, the other Dao's did not put his accounts. He deals in anything paperless. He lays bricks, layers chicken, sells firewood, he sells chocolate. And he attributes all his wealth to that. It makes you think, should I abandon the sanctuary? And start selling firewood. But of course, it cannot be from legitimate resources. The issue still is do we have capacity as a land person to timely detect these properties and even discern that they could not be from legitimate resources? You'll find the children owning a lot of property, might not talk about it. They are very good. But the key issue here is concealment. One of the things I've learned from the time I worked with asset recovery is the easiest way, actually, for me to look at if I have a male suspect, I look at their wives. <laughs> yes, they like to decorate them, they will drive all the nice cars, they will dress so well, and it is easy to know this and this much here. But again, it takes. You cannot blame someone for driving a nice car. Don't stop there. You have to look at them. It takes us and it takes time. And the issue again is are we all moving prosecutors and investigations at the same pace? Those are the issues we should think and look at to talk about that. That is uh, asset management. We are must talk about it a lot. When did we send us for attachment for asset recovery? One of the things I took home with me was never recover anything that it is. And that's one of the wisest plans I've ever seen. You cannot just go and recover anything. For instance, you cannot go and recover someone, restrain someone's back and some way to manage it. How will you balance those things? How will you manage? And you know, you expose yourself and to that way to some litigations. It's not your field. My Lord just is giving the precise. It's not your field, you cannot even venture there. So usually what we do is, when we get to these restraining orders, because of those challenges, if it's a nice car, we don't touch it. We let you, we let you keep your car. We just bring fence our interests over it, that we might bend over conviction and have something to fall back to. We let you stay in your nice house. Our interests <coughs> make sure that you don't dispose it all before your case ends and you know if you are going to be able to secure an order which will enable us to make look at that property. Uh, yes, the asset forfeiture, a specified asset recovery division, I totally agree. Yes, we all have administrative units, GPP's office, IG, and police cars. But this is not the one that we should look at for the effective asset recovery. For instance, we have one, Grace gave us some detectives, they are in house. But they do not have the ability, let's say, to do financial profiling, financial analysis, values, management, all those attributes. And I think if we have a unit properly uh, established, facilitated, and empowered to do all these things, we shall be able to go a long way. Uh, Mr. Chen Evans mentioned something about execution division, and I agree with him also. He said something about he proposed, and I wish to add my questions of proper is the execution orders to be assigned to a specific judicial officer. Because when we go to the execution division, they are going to be lumped up with their already existing government. And it's true, you will go, and the date you get is two months, and here you have someone struggling to be able to take that product away from you. And this comes in, 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 in a, a situation where Right now, we do not have cogent post recovery or post preservation mechanism. I can only properly sustain a restraining order before conviction, but after that, it doesn't come out so well. So, usually, what we do, we just start that process. And of course, they always apply, they appeal, and they ask for orders to stay exception. And at times, we, we ask for uh, for caveats to be started just a way of, we just do it like that. So I don't want to overshoot the time that is in the hospital. Good morning, Dr. Lewis. Thank you so much for uh, not wasting my time. Uh, may I take this opportunity to invite um, Simon Kajura, the head of the head of the head of the recovery office of the IG. Thank you, Chair. Um, 
Good afternoon, everyone, on Protocol Observe. Um, I'll try to also scoot through what I have in the interest of time. Now, we've had a lot of uh, what I'll call theorizing. Um, we've had the concepts. So I'll try and make mine a little bit more practical. Possibly, where possible, um, drawing from experiences we've had from our work at the IG and uh, elsewhere. I would like to start by going to something that Liam presented when she talked about the chain. Detection, preservation, and enforcement. Now, at the IG, and I'm sure to a certain extent, say at the ODPP, and I'm sure this is the reason why ODPP asks the AIGP to give them some people to be embedded in the unit. Our problem is that we are finding that we, as the Assets Recovery Unit, are regarded as relevant only when uh, a judgment has been passed. And in that judgment, there is an order for recovery or compensation. Now, we have real challenges. I'll give you about three cases. In a recent plea bargain case, the reasons given why the gentleman was being given a non-custodial sentence were that he was very elderly, very sick, destitute, uh, and maintaining a large number and extended family. And therefore, he should not be incarcerated. Now, all that read exactly as a submission as to why you should not consider when you say here is the here is the here is the judgment, you extract the orders and go and execute. All he has to do is present present that uh, that agreement and I'm defeated. I can't even have him in civil prison. Because they're saying, look, the man is practical on the deathbed. So if they had taken this into consideration while, while they were agreeing the, the plea bargain, we should have had some sort of security to say, how do you intend to pay this back? In another case, I dispatched my officers to serve somebody in Nakasongola prison because we wanted the person to pay back their stolen funds. I didn't know until the person came, this lady came to, to see me in the office to try and bargain for a schedule of payment. And she was kneeling and saying, we are very good people. Then she told me a story. When my officers went to serve her, when she came to, to talk to them, she was ordered by the prison services to sit on the ground because they are not allowed to sit, sit at the same level with the visitors. Now, she looked in such a bad state that the officer that sent who were very good Christians, decided to pray for her and to pray with her. The prayers were so good but, uh, that she was actually released much earlier than she was supposed to be released. And when she came, she told me that after praying with her, they gave her 10,000 shillings for some soda or something. So you're giving me cases that are so complicated that my officers, instead of recovering, are feeling sorry and instead giving the person money. <laughs> this, this, this is the issue. Another case recently, somebody was asked to either serve uh, three years in jail or, as an alternative, pay 1.2 million shillings as uh, a fine. The man has opted to serve the three years. But I also have a judgment together with instructions that I should recover the five million. Now, if a person would rather serve three years than pay 1.2, what chance do we have of recovering the five million? It's impossible. Which brings me to the, the issue of the chain. I think it's a focus on the two elements.
Yes, you're looking at the predicate offense, whether it's embezzlement, corruption, or whatever, but you must be tracing the money. It is important to trace the money. And I'm sure the, the, the cases I've read of settlements from Josephine's side, because the owner has well done, I think, money laundering as of now. I think part of the reason people settle is because uh, the, the properties had been, I think, uh, seized and frozen in cases of money. So if we don't go in and start, identify these, these, these uh, detect and identify these properties, seize and freeze them so that we preserve them. At the end of the day, we're going to have nothing but uh, um, pieces of paper which we can't enforce. I share the concerns of going to the execution division of the High Court. I believe we are filing the next batch of about five. We have already five pending. And the unfortunate bit is that all the five, we are probably asking for... Uh, therefore, uh, a lot more is needed to not only for the purposes of training committed to and retaining staff, but also uh, for failing equipment, to uh, equipping, uh, procuring the necessary tools. I, I for us personally to feel our, disappointed when we're pursuing somebody it sounds, who has... It sounds mundane, who has but that's a reality. Because we, I know for a fact that we do have many well-trained officers, but we are hampered with the work because we don't yeah. have the the tools available to them uh, to do what they need to do. Uh, so that, that so there is a need for intervention uh, in that in that in that regard. Legislative, of course, there are many. We do have very good laws on the books, but we need some tweaks here and there to improve certain areas. One of which has already been uh, talked about at length: the civil forfeiture um, provisions. They are there, but scattered in different pieces of legislation, there's no uh, dedicated effort towards having this as a main thrust, as a strategy for a country to recover uh, proceeds of crime. Uh, the key term legislation I think would be very material, uh, but I, I, I don't know um, at what stage we are with, we are at in the, 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 the key term legislation. I think it will be a very good tool in the, in the fight uh, and obtaining the proceeds of, of, of crime. So that's one piece of legislation, in addition to the very good ones that we already have, that I think will be uh, critical in, in, in our fight uh, against crime generally, especially taking away the, the, the profits. Then also, of course, as part of the um, legislative changes, I know there are some people that are against this, but I think it is a good idea to have institutions invite, in, involved in this fight, retaining certain percentages of the, um, of the of assets that they involved in recovery, because it's, it's a tool that has been successful in other jurisdictions. Of course, it can be subject to abuse if, if they are over-enthusiastic, if there's an over-enthusiastic application of it, but I think it does no harm to have it as one of the tools available to to law enforcement. Then administratively, there are certain institutions that need um, serious structural changes in the way they, 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 uh, they operate. Um, some of the challenges they have are systemic. And until you overcome them, then you will have, you will have uh, some, some difficulties. And because of these changes, you have a lot of red tape. So the red, uh, as we all know, some of these decisions need to be made very quickly. But in certain entities, the decision-making processes are painfully slow, and I think certain things need to be done in terms of uh, cutting down the, the, the red tape. One of them, of course, has already been mentioned here, is the creation or strengthening where they exist, strengthening the operation, joint operational teams within the uh, by the different entities involved in law enforcement. So that is one one area that I think needs to be, to be done. Um, the other one is, um, I think, an honest evaluation of the cases that secu uh, convictions are secured in. In majority of these cases, like Simon has talked about, there is hardly anything to, 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 uh, to recover. Um, now, this could be because, of course, 
So I think the statistics might be skewed, and that is skewed in the sense that the number of convictions, not every anti-corruption conviction, case conviction will necessarily result in, 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 in confiscation. So if you take those as a, a percentage, if you take the cases where there are recoveries as a percentage of those where there are no recoveries, then it might give a skewed uh, uh, statistics because majority of these actually do not warrant, I mean, the nature of the case is such that there is no nothing to be recovered. I think the more realistic statistic will be of those cases where they are, they are recoverable assets or they ought to have been recoverable assets, how many result in actual recoveries. I think that would be a more realistic figure now. I talk of those that ought to have because in many of the cases I've seen, um, while there are prosecutions being undertaken, no steps are being taken to identify and preserve the, 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 the assets that could be uh, that could be confiscated if there was a conviction. So you might at the end of the day have the conviction, but if there are no steps that have been taken to restrain the assets, then obviously during the period of the trial that the person have got all the opportunities in the world to find ways of, of disposing of them. Uh, Liam talked about crisis of confidence, the public versus the expectations of the public versus what we are able to deliver. That, that is a given. You see it every day in life, in daily talk, uh, in the bars, in the taxis, on TV, everywhere. So it's something we can't run away from. And I know that we have had some deliberate efforts to, uh, to rebuild the trust, but I think we still need a lot to, uh, to do. So we, we, unfortunately, we don't have the benefit of the doubt, as it were, uh, when it comes to the expectations of the, the public. So until there are certain tangible results that they see, we are not going to have that uh, benefit. And of course, that is not helped by the fact that there are certain institutions within the uh, general sector that have integrity challenges. Of course, in one of the papers that in the parks that were given, uh, it's mentioned, I think that uh, in the national integrity service that the IG has carried out over the years, many of our colleagues here feature prominently at the top as among those that are perceived to be corrupt. So when such a scenario is presented, so obviously the crisis of confidence will always, will always be there. Uh, a lot has been talked about, both by Liam and my, my co-discussants, about the issue of preservation. Now, no doubt it is, it is key. Uh, we, we, we preservation, especially after seizing assets. We have tangible assets versus intangible assets corporeal assets versus incorporeal assets and how we approach them obviously differs. True, we, we have problems with the management of seized assets. Now, I think with the exception of uh, funds that have been frozen on bank accounts or seized from, from homes and of, of course preservation of land where there are caveats, I don't think there are any other good examples that we will cite on how we manage assets after they have been seized. Josephine talked about ring facing the asset. Well, um, for now it could be the option, but allowing the criminal or the, 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 the use, continued use, for example, in the, in the example cited by, by Josephine, if the crook is allowed continued use of the vehicle, well, if I were him, I wouldn't mind. I don't mind if the title is not with me, if I have continued use of the, the vehicle. Because the benefit is in having possession and use of the vehicle. The same with the house. If I'm not allowed to transfer title, but I'm allowed to use the house, then that means I'm still deriving, God forbid, I'm using a bad example myself. Um, but if the criminal is allowed to to the continued use of the asset, and all that is done is stopping them from changing title, then I don't think it goes a long way. 
because the key thing is actually taking away the title. The document is just proof of title. It is not, at the, at the end of the day, what is relevant is the use, because that's what you acquire um, assets for. So that tells you the lengths we still we, we need to uh, we need to go. So in terms of confiscation, I mean seizing of uh, liquid assets, um, I think we, we the view I hold is that subconsciously it is that we those that involved in the decision making process decision whether to seize assets or not subconsciously have this at the back of their mind. If an asset is difficult to, to manage, then they will not seize it. And that's very problematic because most of these assets are difficult to manage. The requirement should be that, for example, if it's a business, we should, we should be putting in place mechanisms to seize and manage those assets. What is prohibited is seizing assets and then allowing them to go to, to waste. But if you seize a business, except if it's an illegal one like prostitution, then you 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 all gambling. You if it's a legitimate business, but the proceeds running those business uh, businesses are illicit, then it should be that we are we, there should be mechanisms to make, to to run those businesses uh, rather than except if they're criminal enterprises, then. The absence of such mechanisms, of course, is a problem. That means we will only go for the soft targets, the land and the money in the, in the, in the banks. And once the criminals grow wiser to this, then obviously they will, if they know that the agencies involved in this fight shy away from confiscation of intangible assets, then that's where they will go. Uh, so I think that's a, a strat something that we need to think long and hard about how we approach it. Of course, one of the suggestions has always been creation of a dedicated uh, unit or authority by whatever name called dealing um, in, in this. Whether that, is, whether that is the way to go or whether it is a question of empowering the different organs of government to do what is within. Whatever option we, we choose to take, at least there must be means by which these assets are seized and managed, including the intangible ones. Now, under the anti money laundering Act, where, where such properties have been seized, for example, there are mechanisms provided in the law, including appointment of uh, asset managers by court. The prosecution applies on behalf of the investigating team that the assets, the business has been seized, if it's a hotel like this one, um, then the, you invite the court to appoint asset managers to run the, the, the business so that the responsibility of running that is moved away from the, 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 this entity and then it is done under the supervision of court. By court I mean by court appointed uh, uh, asset, asset manager. I think that is one, I believe, one of the immediate things that can be, uh, that can be done as we wait for the time when such an institution that, that has been mentioned comes into, into play. Uh, on the, lastly, I am conscious of time, in terms of the illicit financial flows, the amount of flows, the illicit outflows, of course, but the kind of outflows we see, it's quite uh, staggering, to say the, to say the least. But we also see a lot of, well, not a lot, but a significant volume of inflows. Now, of course, the challenge I like, I like posing, including to yourselves, is how do we perceive the, the fact that we have certain assets that are suspected to be process of crime committed in other jurisdictions is is not so much of a secret, or as they say, it's an open secret. And these are properties that are easily identified. But then, what is our attitude towards those individuals that we know to be having properties here, or other assets here, but because these are assets acquired through proceeds stolen from other jurisdictions, we seem not to, our attitude is quite lackluster, to say the least.
and in my view there is a direct correlation in terms of the mind mindset. The attitude we have towards the presence of illicit properties here, generated from proceeds stolen elsewhere, probably is the same. Well, there is a correlation with our own attitude towards assets stolen from us, and then the proceeds are taken either outside uh, the jurisdiction or even within the uh, jurisdiction. So, like Simon uh, did mention, I think some radical mindset shift needs to be promoted. Of course, this this can be done only by the um, the anti-corruption agencies, but all entities that have a role to play in the the moral compass of, of, of society. I'm sure you have heard how we did intervention of all those involved in the moral bringing of, of, of our offspring, the schools, the churches, and uh, and uh, and other and other places. I so submit. Thank you for listening to me. Thank you very much, Sydney. Um, uh, that uh, we would like to make some one two comments that from Simon law enforcement they are now into emotions if we bring in issues of emotions into handling these uh, cases of corruption then we shall do it because for building capacity you need police officers who are trained that the tricks of a criminal, we can put a lot of cro crocodile tears. For me, in my office, people enter, I have a lot of Soviets and handkerchiefs. They go in and throw their, the, the person throws in the handbag, the shoes, they start mourning, so you give them space. Say, so are you done then now? So they need to be trained. But if we go into emotions, then we can't handle that. Then, uh, giving in money, you should have asked them to declare the source of 10,000. <laughs> yes. And then, of course, um, issues of uh, time being uh, of essence. Say, my Lord, does this video is going, some question was put across, maybe you prepare to answer that, that the IGG is being requested to enforce their recovery after the sentence is served. Is it, is it, is it so? Thank you, Chair. It was a request that uh, the order that recovery should only be enforced after somebody has served a sentence should not issue. So it was a request of the question. Because somebody has stolen money. So the moment they are convicted of that theft, then we should be able to begin recovery of our funds immediately. We shall still give you the chance, my Lord, to answer that. Uh, members, we go into plenary. We shall pick suggestions, uh, some, some, some suggestions uh, from you, and then uh, the panelists will uh, respond to them. So we open the floor for the plenary. from the discussion today. At the beginning of the forum in the morning, the Lord, the DPP, said that the forum wanted to interrogate various underlying aspects regarding effectiveness of sanctions and asset recovery. And that he expected that we would take stock of the performance of institutions, uh, re-examine the effectiveness of sanctions in fighting and deterring corruption, analyze the current regime and effectiveness of the asset recovery as an anti-corruption tool and looking at the existing legal institutional framework and lastly extending frontiers of corruption control by exploring avenues for innovation and alternatives that are more effective anti-corruption approaches. We have a summary of the key messages, the key issues that we are taking away from the morning's discussion I'm going to ask Emily to quickly take us through them in the interest of time. Emily. Thank you, Madam Jan.
pilot on protocol tab. Uh, the first key message that we got was citizen engagement. The need to bring the public on board so that they know their roles and that they know that public assets belong to them and so that they are able to report when corruption is committed. For them to be able to know that we hold these assets in their trust and this will call for mass sensitization of the public so that they are aware and they can report cases of corruption. Um, it, has, it was highlighted that we lack asset recovery asset recovery infrastructure um, and uh, the fact that we need to have an institution, an agency in place that is tasked to manage the entire process because as indicated in the discussions is that asset recovery is not a one-off, it is a process that requires a particular institution. Whether this is going to be an independent institution established or whether it is going to be the institutions that are already existing to be strengthened is an issue for further discussion. However, what is critical is that we need to have an institution to follow this through to, to conclusion. Um, then there is an issue of capacity building. It has come out throughout the, the discussions that the key players handling the processes are not up to the task. They are not as skilled and they're not as prepared as the, the perpetrators of the crime. And so we need to have capacity built for the police, the prosecutors, the judicial officers in the area of asset recovery, investigations, prosecution, of money laundering and white collar crime. We need to specifically uh, improve their capacity to trace for assets, identify them, financial profiling, calculate the benefit gained from crime as required under the Act, and ensure proper handling of exhibits. There was a suggestion in the presentation of Liam on the need to do benchmarking with other countries to see what is working there and what is not. And the need not to necessarily transplant what is there, but to tailor make it to suit our purposes here locally. Then there is a, there is a need for review of the existing legislation according to the discussions, it emerged that the asset recovery provisions are thrown around in different acts. And so there is need to have one comprehensive law, uh, like a single reference center where we can uh, go, for, go to find the provisions on asset recovery. But also they need to draft the regulations for confiscation and recovery as required under section 67A of the Anti-Corruption Act and also to develop regulations under the Anti-Corruption Act. There is an issue of the needs-driven corruption where some public officers are forced to, they are predisposed to commit corruption arising out of need. And so the recommendation generally is that there is need to review and enhance the salaries of the public servants. There is a recommendation to consider having civil recovery provisions. Uh, this is based on the fact that the criminal recovery is, is conviction based. And so we need to explore that avenue. There is also a need to have a special court to handle the criminal recoveries so that they are not lumped together with the ones of the civil division. Enhance international cooperation 
in order to enable our stress for assets overseas and recover them and also be able to conduct cross-border crimes investigations. Use the informal networks to enhance international cooperation. Then there's the issue of resourcing the institutions, that there is need for funding to enable institutions execute their mandate. And there was a suggestion to have some of the money that is recovered plowed back to support the institution, a certain percentage, which of course it has been recommended by Leah that it has to be properly defended and it should be structured. If it is administrative, then it might be changed here and then. But if there is a law that specifically provides for this, then it should be able to be enforced. Thank you. Thank you so much, Emily. My Lord. Ladies and gentlemen, those are the key issues that we picked up from the discussions. And, uh, so, and, and uh, thank you all. Um, about anything that we could have omitted. Job right now is uh, quite simple and straightforward. It is uh, to really invite our guest who just arrived for the function to come and uh, close us off. But of course, I need to thank all of you who have come and stayed up to this time. You will join me in uh, thanking the people who have uh, chaired sessions. Let's give them a hand clap. <laughs> you will thank me. You will join me in thanking the people who presented papers, the keynote and uh, the other paper. What was it called by Liam? Was it a second keynote? Yes. But uh, those uh, keynote people, please uh, join me in thanking you. And uh, we thank the organizers as well. We thank the hotel. We thank the people who are taking pictures and uh, they have been posting on social media. And uh, finally, I thank all of you for having been such a good audience. At this juncture, I would like to introduce our guest who is going to close function for us. Justice Jotham Tumwesje is a justice of the Supreme Court of Uganda. And uh, as you all know, the Supreme Court is the uh, highest court. There is a picture that has been going up around on social media with somebody wearing a very long coat. And they always say, is this the Supreme Court? <laughs> but uh, not that kind of Supreme Court. This is the highest court, but uh, just, message, just to let you know, those of you who may not have been around, uh, worked as an Inspector General of Government for quite a number of years. And uh, just to message, I want to tell you that among the people here, <coughs> represented are some people from the Inspectorate of Government. We work closely together, and uh, there are members from the 18 also jealous sectors they are all represented here some of them you see them clad smartly in their uniforms some are plain clothes though they are uniformed officers they are also among and uh, we have uh, prosecutors we have state attorneys we have a uh, uh, judicial service commission and all the other sectors have been here with us we started off at nine uh, we had lunch here and uh, they have patiently been waiting for you. Justice uh, Jotham Tumwesje, among, uh, apart from being a justice of the Supreme Court, is the chairperson of the Jealous Integrity Committee, which is really very relevant for what we are discussing. They, uh, he heads a committee that goes around the country gathering views. Some of the statistics you had us uh, mention in the morning uh, is gathered by, uh, by his team. And uh, therefore, it is very fitting that Justice Tumwesje should be the one to close our forum tonight. Please join us in welcoming Justice Jotham Tumwesje. Thank you, my Lord. My Lord, Director of Public Prosecutions. 
Senior Technical Advisor, JELOS, and uh, the Secretariat, Heads of JELOS Institutions, Development Partners, Officials from various government institutions represented here, and ladies and gentlemen. Um, it gives me much pleasure to make a few remarks this afternoon at the closure of this inaugural Jealous Annual Anti-Corruption Forum held under the theme Purging Profits Out of Corruption a critical reflection on the effectiveness of sanctions and asset recovery. The focus of this forum, which will be held annually, is to explore topical anti-corruption issues in our country with a view to taking stock of gains in the sector, appreciating the prevailing context and mapping strategies for improvement. I wish to thank the Delos Secretariat, the Office of the Director of Public Prosecutions, and the Anti-Corruption Division of the High Court for coming up with this forum. This forum is timely because jealous institutions and other government agencies in the world in the fight against corruption play complementary roles. They must therefore work together in order to be effective and to enforce the existing robust legal framework designed to combat corruption. They must, through their actions, deliver the message to the public that the probability of being caught if they engage in acts of corruption is ever increasing and that there are serious sanctions to be suffered, including the deprivation of the rewards, of the rewards or gains which are good from corruption. In order for sanctions to be effective, they must be proportionate to the crimes committed and be able to deter others and the offenders themselves from committing those offenses. These sanctions should be able to contribute to respect for the law and even provide reparations to the community or the victims of corruption offenses. It is therefore vital to evaluate the effectiveness of the sanctions meted out in corruption cases and devise strategic approaches and interventions that will see us move to the next level in our bid to ensure that crime does not pay and that there are no safe havens for those who commit them, including their stolen assets. This is the message that we should send out to those inclined to commit these crimes every time we successfully identify, confiscate, and repatriate proceeds of crime, thus depriving the criminals of their ill-gotten wealth. A criminal should not receive a sentence of five years imprisonment, knowing that he or she will be wealthier when he gets out of prison because the stolen assets are secure and well invested. We must, together, devise plans to ensure that we hit the criminals where it hurts the most. We must deprive them of the benefits of their crimes. I think a few days ago I read a story of a person who was convicted by the anti-corruption court of theft of substantial amounts of money. And uh, he was sentenced to a fine of two million shillings. And I was surprised. Someone steals, I think it was probably 100 million, I can't remember quite. But a magistrate, the chief magistrate who tried him, sentenced him to a fine of two million shillings. And, uh, and this is definitely not a proportionate sentence. And I think judicial officers who are involved in uh, trying uh, corruption offenses should remember 
but unless we pass deterrent sentences and even recover the story in Essex, we are not going to help in the fight against corruption. Throughout the day's deliberations, and the, the institutions here represented have been able to take stock of their performance and share best practices. They have come up with innovations on how to tackle the corruption problem better and have started the journey towards cooperation and harmonization of their approaches. It is encouraging to note that significant strides have been taken in implementing the asset recovery provisions in the Anti-Corruption Act 2009 as amended and the Anti-Money Laundering Law. More work, however, needs to be done to identify the bottlenecks, the gaps in the law, the opportunities we can harness, and the best practices we should adopt in recovering proceeds of crime. As we leave this forum today, we should question how investigators can secure critical information from financial institutions authority, Bank of Uganda, Uganda Registration Services Bureau, Uganda Revenue Authority, and the Ministry of Lands and Housing about land ownership, banking information, business registration, and others. This information is very important because proper identification and tracking of assets requires good investigative skills. The criminals are smart at hiding their ill-gotten wealth, thus making identification a real challenge. Investigators and prosecutors must show and establish the link between the corrupt activities and the assets arising therefrom. We must enhance the capacity of investigators, prosecutors, and courts to act swiftly to freeze the assets so as to avoid quick disposal of those assets. With the touch of a mere button, money can be sent to different directions around the world in the shortest time. We need strong partnership with the agencies in Uganda and abroad to support mutual legal assistance in matters of asset recovery and cross-border investigations. This requires strengthening both the informal and formal communication systems. I draw specific attention to the fight against corruption within our institutions. The justice, law and order sector anti-corruption strategy is a framework designed to enable planning in order to make a significant impact on reducing corruption in the sector institutions as well as building and strengthening the quality of accountability in the country as a whole. It focuses on the institutions, members of staff, and systems in general in order to create an efficient and effective service delivery. We cannot address corruption effectively in other institutions unless we first remove the speck in our eye. We must, to that effect, implement the jealous and institutional anti-corruption strategies to curb and punish in-house corruption <coughs> while rewarding those who serve professionally and with integrity. I need not remind all of you that apart from its moral or immoral aspects, corruption is very dangerous to our country. It stops essential services from reaching the people, especially the vulnerable members of our community. It hampers economic growth and it affects and undermines the rule of law. I urge you 
to implement the resolutions made here today and embrace the good practices shared in order to effectively deter corruption offenses. I thank you very much for listening to me. And with that, I have the pleasure to declare this forum closed. Thank you very much.